This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Three minutes after 10 is the time. A very good morning to you. I- I'm still a bit uh, discombobulated by yesterday's events. I- I'm speaking of the political reshuffle, we'll probably get stuck into that. But I thought I'd throw you something different first, early doors. We'll be talking about the Conservative Party in, in a couple of minutes. But I, I just, you know, sometimes I try very hard to take a step back from the fray and, and, and work out what it is that's troubling me. There's a story around today about a National Trust calendar that's been given out to volunteers, and some people are having a, a right old hissy fit because it contains some festivals that um, uh, Muslims and Hindus celebrate, but doesn't contain references to... Christmas and Easter, the the, the rationale behind it is that you don't really need to be reminded of when Christmas and Easter are if you live in this country, but if you're trying to be a little bit more inclusive, i.e. understand the festival. This weekend, for example, if you live uh, in in, in Hounslow, in the London borough of Hounslow, you, you could have been forgiven for, uh, if you weren't aware of the Festival of Light of Diwali, you, you, you could have been forgiven for thinking that you'd somehow m- missed bonfire night and, and the fireworks displays had come along at a slightly different period. So, listen, I probably wouldn't have done it, that particular thing. Um, but then if I... if it, Well, actually, maybe I would have done because you can't allow the woke finder generals to determine what you do. If, you, if you're trying to do something that is more inclusive than what is usually done, then you include the things that people don't know about. But I think you could have included the things that people know about as well. But of course, the complaint is that Easter and Christmas are Christian festivals. Don't at me with the Druid heritage of Easter. I'm, I'm, I'm across it, but I don't think there's anything controversial about describing the commemoration of both the birth and the death of Christ as Christian festivals. And yet I haven't seen hide nor hair of a very measured and interesting intervention from the actual Archbishop of Canterbury on the question of a ceasefire in Gaza. So I just I just thought I'd note that. I think we might talk about it in the second hour. I'm not sure. But the, um, the, the, the first hour of the programme will be about the Conservatives. The, the The first thing I wanted to put in front of you was that weird dichotomy. How, do you care a lot about Christian traditions? Do you care a lot about Christianity? Are you very Christian? Do you really care Christian? Christian. Yes, when there's a National Trust calendar that has got Diwali in it, but not Christmas, I am out. Okay, what do you think about the Archbishop? Of, who? What? I, I didn't even know he'd said anything on this. It's just odd, isn't it? that corners of the media are going to try to get you angry about a calendar while completely ignoring calls for a ceasefire from the... He's not the head of the Church of England, is he? I think that's the king, technically. But he's the most senior cleric, the most senior priest in the Church of England. We, oh, don't listen to him. He's calling for a ceasefire. Shut up. Get cross about a calendar. Completely ignore the most senior cleric in the entire church. I just thought that was quite interesting. I thought that was quite interesting. Six minutes after 10 is the time. Um, The Conservative Party. How can it be considered a political party in any traditional sense of the word? Because while you can have rogue elements on the back benches, you can have people, rebels, if you like, on the back benches who, who, who routinely or, or regularly defy the whip and, and lead on to the uh, um, uh, sort of rebellious phases, to have people front and... I, I'm really interested in this because I, I, I think coalition government is really interesting, not in the British tradition, not, not when... A party fails to get an overall majority, so it has to do a sort of grubby deal with a third party, and and, and historically the Liberals or the Liberal Democrats. I I mean other countries. I thought the result, the election result in Poland was fascinating, and the governing party got more votes than any other party, but they lost because there is more agreement and consensus among opposition parties, uh, which creates a majority and, and a mandate for government. So 
I, I, I am intrigued by that because I can see the advantages of it. I can see the leavening effect that coalition government has. You could shave some of the sharper edges off a policy platform by dint of having partners from a more moderate position. And I suppose vice versa as well. You could toughen up uh, a moderate, a very moderate policy platform by, by dint of the necessity of having slightly more radical partners from the, the, from the left or the right or, 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 or somewhere else. Um, so I can see an appeal in the idea of uh, uh, having a what's the word I want? Is it a diverse cabinet? The problem is, if I say a diverse cabinet, the woke finder general will probably have an embolism. I, I, all I mean is a diversity of opinions, but they've turned diversity into a dirty word now. You know what I mean? I feel sorry for the dancers. Is it Ashley Banjo's lot? They're called diversity, aren't they? But they've turned diversity, small d, into a dirty word. Um, but it is, it's a diversity of position, a diversity of opinions. Uh, when I did my politics A-level in 1990, it was still very much the case that collective cabinet responsibility was a thing. And, and in some ways it still is. So the idea was that once a decision had been taken at cabinet, albeit that the decision is usually taken by the prime minister, once a decision had been taken at cabinet... Every cabinet minister had to abide by it. You couldn't go rogue. You couldn't go off message. In some ways, that would be part of the rationale if we were living in normal times behind the latest sacking, the most recent sacking of Suella Braverman. Uh, I mean, she, I think, refused to accept the prime minister's guidance on what she could and couldn't write in her attack upon the Metropolitan Police. But there was a perception, wasn't there, that she was veering away from the path that Rishi Sunak was trying to follow. So, so you have, you know, a, a tradition, a relatively healthy tradition of collective cabinet responsibility, which you could also have in coalition because you'd negotiate yourself to a point where everybody could agree on a policy, but it wouldn't be the policy necessarily that the prime minister started with. His coalition partners would have to have their position taken into account as well. But I want you to look, uh, and I apologise for this because it's not a pretty view, I want you to look at two politicians this morning. I want you to look at David Cameron and Esther McVeigh, who until recently was one of the presenters on GBBs, where they uh, routinely bang on about how awful vaccines are, um, how awful the government is, and how we are secretly being governed by... Uh, a, 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 a clandestine cabal of power brokers, none of whom can ever be named. It's a bit like a Nadine Dorries, Dorries novel. I'm sorry, a, a, a non-fiction, a work of non-fiction by, by Nadine Dorries. Um, and, and he's brought her back. So it seems to me that our analysis yesterday that the sacking of Suella Braverman marked an end of the culture wars was quite spectacularly wrong. While it looked right... I was claiming the credit for it, whereas in fact it was all you. You you rang in repeatedly to tell me that the appointment... I can't believe how wrong you got that, honestly. It's a good job no one's paying you, because you'd have to give them the money back. It was categorically your fault that yesterday's programme very much gave the impression that we all thought the sacking of Suella Braverman spoke to uh, a cessation of culture war, as if Sunak had given up on that. Because at tea time, he appointed Esther McVeigh and let it be known, because these things don't appear in the newspapers by accident. They don't sprout organically from the ether. Um, he let it be known that she would be the Minister for Wokeness. The Minister for Wokeness. Even Nick this morning struggling really to pin down precisely what is meant by woke or, or wokery. I presume it's calendars not having Christmas in them, probably, despite the fact that it's a calendar designed to make the general population aware of festivals they wouldn't ordinarily celebrate or be aware of. But hey-ho, on we go. How can a party contain both David Cameron and Esther McVeigh? 03456060973. And I know that this will sound a little insincere, but it isn't. It, it, it's just that you judge me by my past performances. It, it's interesting to me who could possibly still support the Conservative Party. I don't, and don't take this the wrong way, but I don't think you actually do support the Conservative Party. I just think that you are so caught up in footballification that you cannot conceive of ever voting for anybody else. You're like a die-hard fan. You're like the fans that go to all the away games. What percentage of the average support for a football team go to all the away games? I, I wonder if it holds true across all clubs, actually, even if you've got a very small following. The rough percentage of fans that will make the journey for an away game 
is about a quarter or a, a tenth of the average home crowd. I think Kidderminster sent about 100. We got about 100 people to uh, Aldershot the other night, which, which gives you a, a sort of idea about what the diehard Kidderminster Harriers fans look like. But the diehard fans of the Conservative Party have given up, really, um, trying to work out what it is they stand for. You're just certain that you hate everybody else. You're just absolutely certain that you hate everybody else. And therefore, your support for them is unshakable. Because I bet you could not tell me what they currently stand for. See? Hear that silence? Feel that tumbleweed spinning across the studio? What does Rishi Sunak's current cabinet, or what does the Conservative Party in its current form actually stand for? What is it that you support? And the reason why I think that sounds insincere is because I'm about to say I would genuinely like you to phone me. I, I, I mean, I can't let you have a free pass. I can't let you say things that aren't true. But if you support the Conservative Party, the Conservative Party that contains at cabinet level both David Cameron and Esther McVeigh, what is it that you support? What is it that, that they stand for, in your view? Hit the numbers now. You will get through. 0345 60 and then we will, as ever, throw out a slightly broader question as well that, that, that invites contributions from anybody who's been paying attention. What, what's happened? What's happened to the Conservative Party? You don't have to be a supporter of it to answer this question. The, the, the rest of us are watching just as uh, goggle-eyed as you are. What the heck has happened? I mean, how feasible is it that Rishi Sunak surveyed the entire Parliamentary Conservative Party it's a big bunch of people. You know, Boris Johnson's big majority has been nibbled away at by events and by-elections and the rest of it. But it's been nibbled away at, it yet remains a huge constituency of, of, of people. And then he looked at the House of Lords as well, because, you know, it, 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 it's more of a 19th century than a 20th century thing, but... There was a, um, a secretary. Of, there was a foreign secretary, wasn't there, um, under Margaret Thatcher, who was called from the, who was uh, picked from the House of Lords, Peter Carrington. So he looked at every single member of Parliament who is a Conservative, and he looked at every single Conservative member of the House of Lords, and he decided that there was nobody, nobody fit to be foreign secretary. So he appointed David Cameron. I, I don't know what that means, but it, but it's got to mean something. So, 15 after 10, question number one. Can you tell me, either as a supporter or, 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 or a foe, whether the current iteration of the Conservative Party stands for anything? 03456060973. And then I want you to tell me how the Prime Minister has ended up in a place where the only person he considers fit to be foreign secretary is a former prime minister who left office surrounded by failure and regret and at the same time brings in a strange woman uh, known really for a failed television career and not much else and, and subsequently presenting on GBBs to, to, to battle unspecified wokeness. There's a lot there to get your teeth into, um, and, and I look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Uh, the time is 10.16. The number you need, as always, is 0345 606 Matt in South Norwood wonders whether this means Labour will have to appoint a shadow minister of wokery. I do know. I don't know, actually. I, 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 I doubt it, as I'm sure you do as well, but it'd be quite funny if they did. You'd just have to stand up every 10 minutes and say, sorry, what exactly do you mean by that word? Well, we mean um, I, you, people who put cream on before jam when they're eating a scone. That's woke. People who wear their T-shirts inside. I don't know what it means, but it's very, very bad. Calendars. That kind of thing. Um, what's going on? What's happened to the Conservative Party? That's the fundamental question this morning. What has happened to the Conservative Party? And what does it say that Cameron has been brought back. 03456060973. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 
It is 20 minutes after 10, and it is, uh, I mean, it's a remarkable state of affairs. Sometimes you have to step back from it to appreciate just how extraordinary it is. But Rishi Sunak looked for 10 minutes yesterday as if he'd called time on culture wars. The nonsense of, of, of fighting woke without being able to really describe what it is. And even if you think you can describe what it is, even if, for example, a national trust calendar is enraging you today, um, what would a politician do about that? You're going you're gonna to force the National Trust? You're going to you're gonna de- define what, what institutions and charities can put and can't put on their calendars? Don't be silly. Uh, so it looked for 10 minutes as if he'd called time on all that nonsense, the sort of 30p Lee school of politics, and then he appointed Esther McVeigh as woke finder general. So I don't understand what's going on, and I wonder whether Conservative supporters do. What does your party mean now? What does it stand for? Whose party is it? David Cameron's, Rishi Sunak's, or Esther McVeigh's, or 30p Lenox? Is it a good thing to have such a diversity of opinion? In pl- I don't know. I'll stop talking. I'll start listening. Julian's in Marlow. Julian, what's happening? I, I think it's just a case of Rishi, in this case, balancing <coughs> the Tory membership books um, Suella Braverman went a bit too far, and that, I think, upset the traditional, more centrist Tory voters. Which bit uh, of what she did upset that that constituency? I think criticising the police to such an extent, mm. materially calling the wrong party out for the perceived vo- the the, th- the threat of violence yes. that the marches were that the march was going to elicit. She made it all about the um, uh, Palestinian uh, groups marches, yes. or the Palis- yeah the Palestinian supporting uh, marches, but in fact it was her incitement to the right wing uh, extremists to come forth and I, do you uh, know, create I, I troubles. Think that's the best, just in terms of the words you chose. That's the best description of what happened that I've heard. Uh, mat- I hope you've recorded it because I don't actually remember exactly what Well, the, was, just okay. your use of the word materially, because, you, you, you know, the, the, first of all, this idea that there's something left-wing about people marching for a ceasefire and something right-wing about violent thugs, violent hooligans uh, uh, menacing around the cenotaph. You, you managed to cut through that, which I don't think I managed to do yesterday. And secondly, it, well, you're absolutely right. It was the subversion of observable reality, wasn't it? I mean, that, it, that's... <clears throat> It's, uh, to quote, a, a, a great right-wing thinker, Ben yes. Shapiro. Mm, back, let's, uh, let's not, let's not spoil it, Julian. Let's, let's not spoil it. We were getting on so well. Carry on. No, no, but, <laughs> but I mean, that's the, what, that's the only thing with which I agree, but most of the time he turns oh, out to be counter yes. his own arguments. But yes. the, the facts matter. Your feelings, as you know, traditional, normal right-wingers would say, your feelings don't matter. These are the facts. Well, these are the facts. The observable facts are that the people that... Suella Braverman was painting as being the perpetrators of, mm. or the potential perpetrators of violence were not the potential purpose. The, the actual perpetrators of violence, those were the more right wing extremists. Yes, and, and, she, and she did, she seeked to portray the opposite as the actual. So that would have alienated. And she continues to do so. Well, she the does continue thing to is do she so. Hasn't, she hasn't said, oh, called that one wrong. It was actually my right wing thugs that yeah. came out. No, you're right. She, do- she doubled down on the deception. So that, that alienates what we might call sensible conservatives. Exactly. I'm not, let's not argue whether they are sensible no. at all, but they have a, they have a, uh, a clear benefit if the conservatives are in, yeah. i.e. lower taxes and, yeah. uh, and so forth. So, um, by going so far uh, against logic and clarity and good conservative values and being right-wing extremists, inciting people to violence against the police on such a, an important day in the calendar and mm. of particular importance due to the various struggles going around the world, most of which, uh, most yes. important of which are the, in this particular area is in the Middle East, in of Israel course, and yes. Palestine, um, She's alienated the traditional conservatives. Now, Rishi Sunak, I never, cri- I, I never think that any of these ministers are stupid or uh, illogical because that gets them off the hook too easily. Mm. Rishi Sunak is clever with numbers. Yes, it, I imagine that it, there's some spreadsheet, some database that is looking at the net impact of each minister uh, uh, doing yes. whatever, and somewhere there is a table that is collating this information and shows Suella went too far and has 
um, created a problem with our traditional core Tory voters in the South, typically the Southeast, but the South. Yeah. Or whilst she might be, uh, she might have been useful for the more Ganony <laughs> Tory voters, yes, or the, the Red Wall, or the converts from the Labour Party, and so forth. She's she's um, tipped the balance. She's, she's now, gone too far. So he needs then to far, bring in some someone who is gammon friendly. Exactly. So uh. she's gone into the uh, she's gone into a deficit. So she it needs to be expunged, and she has been expunged. But in order to provide a salve or a a, a consolation prize for that gammon right wing, mm. then, boom, Esther McVeigh, anti woke yeah, right, lovely, get all that, yeah. Oh, I, I, I'm going to just, pa- I'm going to pause you there, because I, 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 I object to the accent that you deployed, because quite it a was, lot of them are very... Of the three, it was about the three, the three people who were oh, in the, uh, Waterloo London Station, station at, uh, yesterday. Yeah, all Waterloo right, well, I'll, I'll allow that, but most of the gam- gammonati that I encounter are, are quite middle class, and... and, and um, I, as I said, multi- I always say, Neither race nor creed nor region uh, or accent are any barriers to being an absolute beep, 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 gammon. Beep, whatever you want. Gammon. Gammon. Yes. In this case, let's go with gammon. Okay, so, so in so some ways says, now I'm worried because I don't get those phone calls anymore, but the phone in should be maybe someone else can do this. As a proud member of the gammon arty, is Esther McVeigh enough to fill the hole left by Suella Braverman in your fever dreams? I. Uh, uh, in my, own, I hope not. I hope she fails massively and gets mm. it completely wrong. But uh, time will time will tell. I don't know materially. I don't know what she's going to say. I don't have access to her calendar, and I don't talk to her directly, but <laughs> or talk to her at all. But but, but the um, problem is, and you've actually highlighted it quite perfectly. The problem is that at being anti woke is all about rhetoric. It's why it's really the, the, the preserve of the newspaper columnists and the, and the commentators. Because as soon as you seek to become substantive with your anti-woke rhetoric, you end up looking ridiculous and or dangerous, or both. Well, you've heard today, I think it was on, um, uh, uh, on Nick Ferrari's show, where a minister tried, couldn't define it. Yes, I, I, I hate it when Nick steals my most popular questions and then hits, them, hits Tory ministers over the head with recently, it. recently, James. You should have trademarked it. I couldn't, possibly comment. I couldn't possibly comment on that. But but it is... It. So so what she did was try to turn it into substantive policy or substantive policy pronouncements, i.e. attacking the police and maligning peaceful protesters and appearing to incite far-right hooligans. And that's the point at which the algorithm breaks. Therefore, she has to be chucked out. So Esther McVeigh's job is to keep it vague. Just talk about calendars and talk about um i i don't know pronouns or something yeah values 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 and pronouns don't don't whatever you do talk about the police or protesters no or if no No, that's not true uh, you can talk about the police but you have to say things like why are they wearing pride helmets when they should be out catching murderers you can't say their institution yeah yeah, look if it doesn't work out at lbc you know i know it's a bit touch and go it is a bit then you could definitely work for esther as an advisor i could be in there i could be in there touch and go as people keep stealing my lunch with questions about wokery so there it is so listen if you're going to talk about the police esther just say stuff like why are they dancing at the notting hill carnival when they could be out catching rapists don't actually accuse them of being biased against or uh, biased in favor of people marching for a ceasefire as opposed to people marching against the ideals of the black lives matter movement um thank you julian that was really strong stuff julian has set the bar quite high but i sense that he wasn't speaking from a position of loyalty of of tory support and if you are traditionally a supporter of this party what does this party stand for today it's half past 10 thomas watts is here with your headlines james o'brien on lbc james o'brien on lbc it is 10.33, and I think that was very, very strong, actually, that first call, because the, 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 the mystery of wokeness, this incredibly inflammatory idea, it just it means whatever. If you're joining me, if you've been in a coma for 10 years, it's the new word for political correctness. You know, you, you can't say what you want in this country anymore without, without, without being sent to prison, as Stuart Lee has famously explained. You can't say what you want about immigration without being called a racist. Say racists. 
Um, and, and that was political correctness gone mad. You're not allowed to, you know, say disgustingly rude things about people anymore without feeling. And that's changed, really. You can now. Flipping Farage is going into what I'm a celebrity. Get me out of here. So, you know, the, the idea that you can't be publicly racist anymore in this country, I think, has been fairly uh, roundly dismissed in recent years. But you have to stay angry. These people have to stay angry. I can't get angry about that. You got what you wanted with Brexit. You got what you wanted with Boris Johnson. You got what you wanted with Liz Truss. You got what you wanted with uh, David Cameron even I suppose so you've got you've had everything you've wanted for 13 years all the things you voted for have happened and you're still bloody furious what are you furious about today calendars okay that's great you're furious about calendars but don't turn it into actual policy because the minute you turn it into actual policy you lose the sensibles so you've got that 15 to 20 percent of support which is Probably the same 15 to 20 percent that would be comfortable with a fascist movement rising into power in this country. They can't possibly go anywhere else except the Conservative Party or whatever weird little outfit sets up just to the right of the Tory party. Increasingly hard to do, of course, because the Tory party's moved so far to the right in the last few years. At 15 to 20 percent of the electorate. If you're not in that, but you are a one nation conservative or you are uh, uh, desirous of lower taxes or you think that too much money is spent on things like helping the poor or educating children or um, child benefit, you know, you, you, you very much of that view, then you are not necessarily going to go along with uh, substantive anti woke policies like, for example, inciting violent far-right thugs to desecrate the cenotaph while pretending that the real problem is being caused by 300,000 overwhelmingly peaceful protesters a mile and a half away. That, I think, breaks the fourth wall. It breaks the, it breaks the paradigm. You can't carry on supporting that, so Braverman had to go. Replace her with, what's the chops, McVeigh? And it's absolutely fine because she'll just shout about pride helmets, people dancing at the Notting Hill Carnival and calendars. She, she can't do anything about any of it, but at least there'll still be someone there to, if you like, a maypole around which all the gammon can dance. He needs a gammon maypole. That's quite a good figure of speech. So uh, Esther McVeigh is a gammon maypole. He needs something around which they can all dance, but whatever you do... Don't do anything substantive or meaningful, like attack the Metropolitan Police and incite far-right hooligans to desecrate the cenotaph. Which is why, in an almost perfect proof of this theory, which is why she can attend Cabinet, but she is not a Cabinet member. That is, I think, the icing, the cherry on the icing on the cake of the theory that she is a PR appointment, a gammon maypole, whereas Cameron is a political appointment. Although I find them both a bit baffling. Michael's in Bolton, which is quite funny, Michael. Do you know why? Why? Because it says Michael Bolton on my screen. <laughs> well, to be honest, um, the woker, uh, the anti-woker arty, they, they love me. I'm, I'm autistic, I'm non-binary, and I'm also gay. So, um, Welcome yeah, aboard. I I think, I just, do I shout bingo? Do I shout house now? Do I shout house? Yep. <laughs> bingo! <laughs> what do you want to say, Michael? So, I think, you know, you were saying that they looked across the House of Lords and the House of Commons to find um, a new foreign secretary, and they've just ended up with um, uh, David Cameron. Yeah. I don't think it was that they couldn't find anyone. I think it was more that they're trying to recapture that that kind of... the the happiness that they see as kind of the beginning of the um the the Tory rule in 2010 and it's just been ever increasing ever decreasing returns ever since Cameron resigned and then we got prime minister after prime minister and to be honest I did not like um David Cameron at all when he came in mm. I have many words that I could say for him which are not broadcastable on radio um but, you know, at, at least with, you know, you mentioned coalitions at the top of the programme, at least with the coalition, there was kind of something stopping the stopping the kind of bulldog trying to attack a small child. You yes. know, it was... Yes, there was a, there was no, an, there was just, a, it felt different, didn't it? I mean, uh, the, you know, austerity yeah. was absolutely grim and, and utterly disgusting. Yeah. But, and, and ideologically driven, but it, mm. but you could... You could do the sums, Michael. You could work out yeah. what they were doing and why they were doing it. Whereas since... Since Theresa May left office, it has been impossible. It has to use 
Dominic Cummings' own analogy, it's it's been like a shopping trolley with a wonky wheel. There's no rhyme or reason in the direction that it is heading off in, and I don't think that's changed under Truss or Sunak, oddly, because you might have expected more from Sunak. Yeah, so it's it feels it feels almost like now the Tory party is literally just grabbing on to whatever's popular. Yeah. Um, you know, we've had kind of Lee Anderson and Janella Braverman and um, going, you know, and saying like, oh, well, you know, the cruelty is the point, which is kind yes. of ironic considering um, Braverman is a Buddhist. I don't know how she managed to square that and half the things she's saying, but that's a, another oh, chapter wait, another wait, time. Wait till you hear about Jacob Rees-Mogg being a Christian. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, well, he's a... He's a he's a unique flavour of Christian, let's put it that way. Um, but now it's they're just grabbing onto anything they can. They seem to think that if they're trying to recapture the magic of 2010, where Cameron was popular, now he's been in a you know he's he's been kind of doing some. Who is he popular with, Michael? Popular. Who is he popular with, Michael Bolton? Um. Well. <laughs> That's a good question. We, talk, um, well, we got one call moment, yesterday off a bloke no called Finn. Call. Fen. Fen rang in yesterday to, to big up David Cameron, and the poor fella couldn't name a single thing he'd ever, ever done. I think maybe it's just the perception of having... He's a winner. In, in he's a winner. No, he did say he wins quite, elections. He's quite round and soft edges, and, and he... He's not, is he, though? Maybe he, he looks impression. the part. I mean, yeah, I, I, I didn't vote. I've never voted Tory... To my regret, I voted for the Lib Dems in 2010 because mm. I thought maybe there might be a bit of a change and that ended up being as useful as a chocolate teapot. Um, I tried to, you know, the other forgotten referendum for alternative voting for proportional representation, we lost that three to, um, three to one, um, 75% down. So, you know, it's, it's not great. So it's just now it's, they're trying to present change mm. and it's, Interesting, but the thing is, the way they want to do change is to go all the way back. Well, you, to, the to, problem to is that we've got ago. trying to pin it down. We end up doing what they do under your analysis, just grabbing on whatever bandwagon seems to be going fastest at the moment. So you, you can't really mm. analyse that politically. You can't really uh, um, write that down as a thesis or a modus operandi. And, and the example I think of is the uh, the war on motorists. Which no, I never knew about. No one told me about the war on motorists. But because they did better than they expected in Oxbridge and Ryslip, winning by 500, losing a massive, massive majority, but squeaking over the line by 500 votes because of ULEZ, they thought, let's do lots of stuff about motorists. But ULEZ has, has, has petered out completely now as an issue because all of the people who thought they were going to have to pay it in Uxbridge and Ryslip, as I explained at the time, the massive, massive majority of them won't have to pay it. So that, there's a good example of a bandwagon. What are we going to do? We're going to fight on behalf of motorists. Down with plant pots. The bigger they are, the worse they are. Down with massive plant pots and multiple bins. That was a conference speech. Abolishing a meat tax and getting rid of seven bins. That was a conference speech. I don't think you can tell me what the Tories stand for. As, as someone who's going to vote for them, come hell or high water, the next general election... And I say, what do they stand for? You, you would just say to me, they're not Labour. Wouldn't you? Be honest. Be honest. Come on. No no harm done. No no fights. No fisticuffs. I say to you, what, why? Well, how can you possibly vote for this lot? 13 years they've been in power. Look at the state of the country. What do they stand for? Just look at the personnel in the cabinet. They've brought back David Cameron, who you probably hate. They've brought in Esther McVeigh, who you might quite like, but she's not even allowed to talk at cabinet. What do they, who are they? What do they stand for? What are you voting for? Well, at least they're not Labour. And that's it. That's it. <sighs> Prove me wrong. Go on, I dare you. Josh is in Hendon. Josh, what would you like to say? Um, hello. hello. I'd like to say that um, I am a, quite a conservative-minded person. Um, but you, sound I very, cannot... you sound very young for that, Josh. Uh, I am. Have you had uh, a, have, did you have a traumatic youth? No, I'm, uh, I'm a religious person. I, and I'm, I, I hold conservative values. For example, um, I, I I believe in I believe in families. And we all believe, believe in families. We all believe in families, Josh. I believe in uh, I, I believe in reduced migration for a country. A country needs borders. How, how does that tie in with your religion? Which religion is 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 that? I'm a I'm I'm a Jew. But well, that's a, a religion that relies entirely upon migration. Well. Generally, migration is fine. Oh, sorry, migration for other people. migration for other people. You're against. No, that's not. No, that's not what I mean at all. Well, what it then? means, well, I'm against too many 
Do you right. Know what I mean? It's a numbers problem. That's not yeah. a religious okay. issue. That's more of a just. Well, I know that's why I rather um, cheekily asked you to to knit together your opposition to migration with your religious views. But anyway, well, you're you're conservative. Anyway, because... So I'm conservative minded, yes. and I just I can't I can't see myself ever voting conservative again because they they don't seem to stand for a single conservative value. They they only have liberal things. They haven't torn down a single thing that Tony Blair put in. They. They, what have they achieved besides taking us out of the EU in a in a pretty shoddy way at that? Right? They they well they did that in order to they, they abolish nothing. freedom of movement, and it might have backfired a bit for now. But you must be in favour of, of 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 controlling our borders, which they keep talking about. Surely. Well, of course I am, but yes. they only talk about it. They didn't do anything. Well, maybe they didn't it's not. Do anything. Well, maybe it is something that is rhetorically designed to appeal to impulses like yours, but they can't do it because it would actually be, as many people have explained for many years, it would actually be very bad for the country to to r- severely reduce immigration. I don't think so. I think I no. think that's based upon the, I think that's based upon a, a view in which you look at the at, at GDP as the most important thing. And not well, no, GDP I was looking at vacancies in the health service actually. Well, the uh, I'm 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 not a big fan of the way our health health service runs. I think it's uh, no, down down with poor. down with that sort of thing. Oh, the whole thing seems to be. So, when, when did you last feel that the Conservative Party represented your anti-immigration, anti-health service, pro-family position? Oh, and also religious positioning. Well, I had. I, I never thought they completely followed what I uh, what I thought. But no. I, I who did does? Have, I, did, I did have a glimmer of hope. Um, uh, I, I had a glimmer of hope, um, and I, it, it turns out I was completely wrong because I should never have trusted Boris. You um, liked Boris Johnson. I thought that uh, I thought that he was going to. But was how gonna does do that tie work. in with your commitment to family values? I well, suppose I you could say he's got loads of. Fam- you could say he's got loads of families, but I sense that's not really what you think you're in favour of the for religious was, reasons. The problem was I never really looked into his personal life. I just looked. Into it was his very hard to miss, and, uh, Josh. He, he had well, children. He had children popping up all over the place. Well, I know that now. You didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that at the time. Gosh. Um, but uh, I thought, if anyone's going to do something... He's an immigrant same, as well, of him. course. He, he, was, he was uh, born, born in America, I think. Well, there you go. So and profoundly, world, I think we could all agree, awesome. profoundly irreligious. Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's come out, yeah. And supremely comfortable with immigration. That's the problem. So what yeah. did you like about him? I thought that he was going to be against immigration. I thought he was going to bring taxes down. I thought he was going to do conservative things. Nothing. Right. Nothing. We got locked down from him. We got that's not a conservative thing to do. We got all these things, and <laughs> they haven't done police reform. Who, who do you like? Who, who, who do you like in the car? Did you like Suella Braverman? Did you like the cut of her jib? She she was okay, but again, yeah. she didn't do anything. It was no. all rhetoric. It's all rhetoric. She doesn't it is, do anything. It's all rhetoric. These people don't do anything. No, thirteen years as well. Yeah, it's uh, it's like what uh, I can't remember who said it, but uh, these are my principles. If you don't like them, I've got other ones. Yeah, I, I, it's a bit like. To be fair, it's a, it's a bit like you claiming that there was a religious basis for your opinions when really it's just anti-immigration and please let me pay less tax. Um, no, I think uh, personally, I believe tax is theft. That would definitely. Well, that, that, that is proving my point, Josh. Not challenging it. No, I don't think so. Well, of course it is. No. Well, I, I just said you want to pay much less tax, and you said I personally yeah. believe tax is theft. How is that a yeah, challenge so to my depiction of you? you? Because you're asserting that this is um, this has nothing to do with with, with uh, my religious beliefs, and I believe it's wrong to steal. Right. But okay, no, you've got me there, Josh. It is absolutely wrong to steal, and yeah. that that is a religiously based political opinion about taxation. Yes. Yes. There you go. There you go, indeed. Well, I mean, peace be with you. Thank you. It's 10.48. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.51 is the time. So um, who exactly is drawn to the current iteration of the Conservative Party? It is nowhere near right-wing enough for some people, um, including our last caller. And yet for others, it has moved far too much to the centre. No, that would be the same thing, wouldn't it? And yet for others, it is far too right-wing, as is evinced by Suella Braverman's recent 
uh, conduct and dismissal and unpopularity. The, the, the approval ratings um, were dismal for Suella Braverman. And that's the weird thing because people in the Mail and, and the Murdoch press will tell you endlessly that they, they this is the silent majority. And then you speak to the country, you, you poll on it, and you're looking at 15 to 20% support. Why is that? Why are racists so desperate to believe that everybody else is privately racist? They just haven't got the guts to say so out loud. I don't know why that is. Is that shame? Does that come from shame? Is it a death? I, 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 you think of... Uh, Paul Dacre, the editor-in-chief of the Daily Mail, has spent his entire career trying to turn the country, the entire country, into a place where his prejudices and bigotries don't look disgusting. If you can gaslight the entire country into being terrified of foreigners or, or um, uh, dedicated to slashing the welfare state, you can turn the entire country into a nasty, mean place. Then nasty, mean people will feel a bit better about themselves. I, I don't know. I'm thinking out loud. But I do know this. I don't think anyone can tell me what the current Conservative Party stands for in meaningful, traditional, political terms. But I'm not going to stop asking. Sam's in bid off. Sam, what would you like to say? Uh, I don't think they actually stand for anything anymore. I think they've run out of things to pretend to stand for. Mm. I think all, all they're interested in doing is, is maintaining power. I don't think they even but really why do they even want the power? Country. Why do they even want power? Money uh, for them and their friends. I think that's Status. all they're interested in. Status. Yeah, and I, th I think it's a purely selfish ambition. don't think any of them really care anymore about what happens. It's become about politicians, not politics. There's not really any policies being argued about. It's everything. Oh, seven bins. About. Seven bins. <laughs> Who cares? Meat it's tax. Just, it's, Meat tax. Yeah, it's just all designed to create anger and confusion and create people choosing sides. S sleeping bags for homeless people. Yeah. Uh, you're right, aren't yeah. you? It's as if she just, or, or they even, because I don't want to let Sunak off the hook. He's come up with an awful lot of rubbish. Um, you, 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 you identify the target that you want people to hate rather than the problem that you want to fix. Yep. I, I, don't, I don't believe any of them really, really care about the country. I, I, I think pretty much all of them are in it for themselves. And I think that the... I think the, I'd, the, I'd, the this, reason probably yeah, they've brought David Cameron back is that he is going to incite more talk about the politicians, and I think that's all they care about is being in the newspapers and being in power. What do they? Yeah, I mean, maybe. What? Why Cameron though? I, I don't. It's got to be a little bit more than that. It, it just looks like another desperate roll of the dice. Actually, the more you think about it, why Cameron? Soon I could reply, why not? Everything else is failing. Why don't I give him a go? At least he won an election. The, the only possible thing I can think is that, I mean, I, I grew up in the, in the Tony Blair era and mm. since then, consecutively, every prime minister seems to have got a little bit worse, not including Liz Truss, because I don't include her in anything. But, no, um, she's anomalous. Uh, yeah, um, e even Sunak versus Johnson. I mean, I think part of the problem with Sunak is that he does appear slightly more statement-like and does appear slightly more sensible well he does appear to be but cameron yeah. everyone thinks cameron is statesmanlike because he sort of bumbles around the place with his shiny face not putting his foot in his mouth that's about the extent yeah. of his achievements is not putting his foot in his mouth the green sill stuff should have excluded him from returning to public life for the rest of his puff it really of should course. but here he is popping up again but, yeah, I think that that's all it is. I think they're, they're trying to put on a show and they're trying to just scrape as much money for themselves as possible. And I think that's I, all I'm always slightly to. wary of that analysis because it, it is a bit simplistic, but sometimes simplistic is true, isn't it? I, I just, I mean, Cameron, for example, makes a lot more money not being, but then he probably increases his capital, doesn't he? He goes back out after being foreign secretary and then some of the damage done by his association with Greensill is undone because he's, he's been back on the world stage looking all statesmanlike, despite the fact that his um, list of achievements is, well, it's very short. Uh, Robert Shrimsley at the Financial Times did a very funny tweet yesterday. He just put, this is a thread of David Cameron's foreign policy achievements. Uh, one of one. You know, when you do a thread, you put one stroke five, because there's going to be five tweets. And he put, this is a thread of David Cameron's foreign policy achievements, one stroke one. That was the end of the thread, which was very clever. Gillian's in Barnet. Gillian, what would you like to say? Oh, hi. Um, I actually have to agree completely with the last caller. Oh, how dull. Um, how dull, Gillian. Can't you pretend to disagree? Say something no, mad I'm about taxes. Say. People Nobody enjoyed that. Say. Okay. But the thing is, 
This government is a complete disaster. Yes. I'm in my seventh decade and I've never seen such an absolute crash happening. No. So, so Ella Braverman was... I don't know why she hasn't been charged with inciting violence. Because no. I've been on three of the marches. And I, I know that there were, there were maybe... On the total of all the marches, maybe a hundred people that said something or did something that they shouldn't have done and should have been brought up by the police. Yes. But you maybe had five, maybe half a million people. I mean, you get more violence at a football match with the 70,000 people. I mean, it's all, it's all the press. And mm. it's this British press that are doing it. You look at or, or the BBC in particular, sorry to have to say it, but the BBC in particular, who, and, and the papers as well, they're always coming down, come down on the side of the far right. By the way, as well. I are think you the sure the BBC? The, I mean, the BBC oh, is yeah. terrified of yeah. getting attacked by the right wing newspapers, so they oh, have to do a sort of I, both sidesism. No. But I don't know that I've seen the BBC as coming down on the side of the far right, Gillian. Have I? Well, maybe not down on the far oh, no. right. Not on the far right. No. Sorry, I'll yeah. pick that. Back. That's all right. Are they, but but certainly, I'm um, going back to the, the actual initial question about the government. Yes. What do they stand it, for? Because it's, uh, the Conservative Party is not Conservative Party. It's a right-wing party now. Mm. If they want to, they should actually split off. The far right should go into their own little party, and the Conservatives should actually remain Conservative. I think, anyway. What do you mean by Conservative? Well, just as, as this other guy, who I don't agree with, the, the guy from uh, Hendon, <laughs> he said about uh, family values. Yes. And he said... The we, Boris he, Johnson he family that, values fan. Yeah, I know. And then he said about... Um, um, what was it? Um, T- taxes, theft. Taxes, theft. Yes. I thought, well, how are you going to pay for everything? I know, it, I know our services are pretty dire at the moment, but can you imagine not having any tax? We well, wouldn't have any services. No, well, People I know would, that, I mean, and I know that, and you know that. But, but it, I was I'm asking what, your, what do you mean by conservative, because you used it as distinct from right-wing, and I think I know what you mean by right-wing. What do you mean by conservative? Just, just uh, having... You know, having a bit of kindness and yes. having a bit of... I mean, you know, there's no kindness at the moment. Kindness no. has gone out the window. I mean, the way... I mean, I, I won't go into the Middle East conflict, but honestly, I'm so appalled at how this government has handled it. Mm. That, I mean, Hamas was bad. I have to admit, it was, a, it was awful. But it was... now, the Israelis are just doing its revenge. Pure bloodlust. I mean, nobody can deny that. Well, lots so, I mean, of people can deny it. Lo- lo- no, hang on. Lots of people can deny it, but but equally they can't deny you the right to hold the opinion that well, you I, hold. Oh, and, yeah, and that's it, my opinion. And it sometimes seems as if they are trying to deny you that right, actually. But um, uh, on we go. Gillian, thank you. You can tell by the music in the background that we've reached the end of that hour, although glancing at my switchboard, I could confidently suggest that we haven't necessarily reached the end of that conversation. Other things on my agenda this morning, while I take a view on whether to continue with elements of the conversation we've just been having, which is really important by the way, if I were to be completely honest with you, the days when the national interest coincides with political gossip are my favourite days. Well, not my favourite, favourite days, but they're definitely in my top 20. Because talking about the state of the government is obviously a very serious and important conversation. But having a bit of a gossip about how awful the members of the government are is also just great fun. And now I've run out of time to tell you about the other stuff that I've got in my pocket. Oh, what an amateur. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is four minutes after 11. Um, uh, Some cracking calls still waiting. Some very good callers waiting. To come on, I am told. So we'll stay with it for a little longer. Um, did it? I, I can remember John Major. So I'm 51, and I, I was doing this job under the last Labour government. And don't laugh, I wasn't that political. Would you believe? <laughs> I was political, but the, the, the things that really radicalised me, if that's the correct word to use politically, were Boris Johnson's. Uh, approach to the firefighters during the industrial dispute. I was very naive about that. And then seeing how the media responded uh, by attacking firefighters. I I genuinely, you can laugh at me now if you want, because it is a bit of an embarrassing admission. So what happened was, I was a showbiz journalist. (laughs) All I ever wanted to do was be a journalist, like my dad. Uh, and I, I, the only way into the industry I could find was being a gossip columnist. 
which was great fun in many ways and absolutely terrifying in others. But I won't bore you with the details. I'll save that for another day. And because I could write a bit and I was quite good in conference, you know, I could talk a good game in front of the editor. I kept getting promoted. So I ended up being show business editor when I was when I was 27 or or 28, it's, which is quite a big deal, but not a very big deal. Piers Morgan was editor of the News of the World at the same age. So, you know, it, it, it was it was good, but no cigar. And then I started getting invited onto TV and radio programs to talk about things like Liam Gallagher's marriage to Patsy Kensett, about which I knew nothing at all. But that apparently didn't matter. You could just sit there and, and you know, speculate or repeat things you'd read elsewhere that morning. And, and I turned out to be quite good at that. Um, so people offered me more work in broadcasting, which moved into political opinions. I ended up on a daytime television show on Channel 5 where we would debate the major issues of the day. And I was all right at that as well. And then I sort of, in a roundabout way, after a year of uh, 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 not doing much at all, I sort of ended up here. And then I became political. Talking to you every day made me realise two or three things. Key being how many people had been gaslit and manipulated in pos- into positions of, of hatred and anger by right-wing media, something that had never really registered with me before. You can laugh again now. That's that. You have my permission. Uh, the second thing that, 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 that I learned when I got here was that there is almost no pushback against these prevailing narratives of anti-immigration or um, anti-welfare state, anti-single mother. The commoditization of hate had been around me for my entire life, both personal and professional, to the point where I'd never noticed how extraordinary, how extraordinary it was. And then things like redistribution of wealth, unfairness. You change my mind about loads of things, some big, some small, until the point where we get to where we are now. And although I did a politics A-level, I also did a medieval history A-level. And no one would think that I was an expert on medieval history. I can't even remember whether it was the Carolingians or the Merovingians in the relevant time scale. I mention all of that, partly because I love talking about myself, but mostly because I can't remember what usually happened. I can't remember. I remember Blair getting in in 97, but I don't remember whether or not the John Major administration that preceded him was collapsing in the way that the current conservative administration is i think it did it was sleaze wasn't it with john sleaze in europe really and again i i drawing entirely upon very vague memories a sense that he wasn't respected by his own membership by his own senior lieutenants uh, i don't think gordon brown's premiership ended like this i i, I think if he if i mean if i remember correctly if he'd gone six months earlier he probably would have romped home, but his, his excess caution meant he wanted to wait until it was even more of a dead cert that he'd get over the line. And events, dear boy, events. So is it a conservative thing? Is it a conservative thing that, that eventually they will just fall apart because uh, eventually being dedicated to self-advancement and the interests of the very wealthy will, will, will just... F- I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this. Nobody can tell me what the current Conservative Party stands for in a positive way, what it is you would be voting for if you marched into a polling booth this time next year and stuck a whopping grey X in the box mark, Tory, what would you be voting for? Because I know what you'd be voting against, largely the lies you've been told by right-wing newspapers. But what would you be voting for? 0345 Speaking of the right-wing newspapers, this new chairman of the Conservative Party, who has been rather embarrassing himself on broadcast media this morning, the question of how anybody thought that he was a good media performer has been answered by, by a colleague of mine, young Connor, who reminded me that, I can't even remember his name, Nick Holder, is it? Paul Holder? Holder. Uh, Holden? Holder? Holding? Richard Holden, thank you. The batsman's Holden, the bowler's Willie. Do you remember that? Oh, that was Holding, wasn't it? Um, 
He was the MP who kept getting quoted in the Daily Mail when they ran 13 consecutive front pages about Keir Starmer having a perfectly innocuous curry in an attempt to pretend that Boris Johnson's serial contempt of Parliament, his egregious lies and his disgusting carousing in Downing Street while the rest of us weren't able even to attend the funerals of some of our loved ones, was, was morally equivalent. You remember, they spent 13 days pretending that that curry carried all the weight and significance of Boris Johnson's egregious conduct. And the MP they kept quoting was, I've forgotten his name again, Nick, 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 Holt, Nick, Charles, R Richard Holden. The MP they kept quoting was Richard Holden. So I think somewhere in the Conservative Party high command, they think, well, he's a media, he's a good media fella. He, he was the one that got that curry all over the front page. It ended in humiliation and embarrassment for everybody involved. But, you know, if they haven't reported the humiliation and embarrassment in the, in the Daily Mail, then the humiliation and embarrassment never happened. That's how reality works in Downing Street. So I think that John, is it Andrew? Pete? Pete. What is it again? I think that Richard Holden has been made chairman of the Conservative Party because he got quoted a lot in the story about Keir Starmer's curry. And therefore, some people in that building, probably the same people that think you should announce the major offices of state with an emoji on social media. I don't know. Did you see that yesterday? They actually used emojis to announce the appointments of new foreign secretaries and home secretaries and the rest of it. Probably in that same office, they've decided that this fellow is going to be a good media performance. 11.11 uh, 11 is the time. Bill writes, do you consider yourself perfect? If not, what are your faults? Oh, Bill, it's your lucky day. My last book, How Not to Be Wrong, The Art of Changing Your Mind, contains seven, eight, nine, possibly ten chapters of my own missteps and mistakes over the years, which uh, you can either get it in all good bookshops, it's enjoying a bit of a resurgence now, Bill, since you asked, thanks to the success of my latest volume, How They Broke Britain, which is, um, which is about all of the people that have brought us as low as we currently are. So, no, far from perfect, Bill, but probably a bit brighter than you. It's 12 minutes after 11, and the question of what the Conservative Party today represents remains unanswered. So there's no pressure on Sammy in Rutland. Sammy, what do you think? <laughs> no pressure at all. Um, I think, going back to what you've said previously, that I think it's sometimes lazy to, to say that, you know, that MPs are in it for themselves and yes. some of the decisions they make are self-centred. I think if we take a step back and, and look at this, I think previously, and I think before the, probably at the point of the Cameron government and before that, you know, I'm not a Conservative voter, but I would look at the Conservative Party and their policies with a level of respect, thinking that it was based on some ideological principles of conservatism, um, economic like a, You mean like a Ken Clark budget? Yes, or, or a, yes absolutely. Yes, and even, yes. If you didn't, even if you didn't agree with it, you, you understood their position. You may not agree with it, but you understood it. And, and you they, spoke the same language. Exactly. Yes. And I think, I think what happened, um, and, and I think it was forced upon them, obviously, with the debate of Europe and Brexit, but by opening that door, they kind of created and opened a back door of conservative ideology that entered in this cultural narrative to what conservatism is. Mm. And I don't think that they deliberately meant to do that. I think that events then took over mm. so that, you know, in winning the debate on Brexit, they realised that they had to add that cultural narrative. And then if you think where media has gone in the last 10, 20 years around that kind of multiplicity of different ideas and views that, that media now presents at different outlets, they realise that to be able to create the, the, the listening figures, etc., they also, and the newspapers, that also was very effective in, in gaining that traction. And so events have carried on where now you see conservatism has been blended with this cultural narrative that I think the Conservative Party, traditional conservatives, don't recognise, and it wasn't previously there, that has completely changed what conservative conservatism is, is, is seen as. Now, I'm calling from Rutland and Stamford, which you'll know is yes. heavily conservative. And I remember being in a, uh, I went to a private school, and I remember being at a sort of a, an assembly sort of talking about the general election where oh, yeah. they did this thing where they said, stand up if you're a Labour voter. And I was the only guy that stood up. Mm. However, all of the people around me, their views I respected. We spoke yeah. the same language and it was around policy ideals. It was around, I, it was around economic ideology. It was something that you could understand. 
with Brexit, I think that a back door was opened and I don't know how they closed, but I also don't know That's a really good point. I'm just going to make a list of... of, Yes, I I just want to make a quick list of things that we might file under what has been let in. So there's a form of nativism or or, or, or racism. Yes, yeah. But also, in more recent weeks, you know, confiscating tents from homeless people or... Yep. Punishing charities for giving homeless people tents. That's that's not something that a traditional conservative could countenance, is it? And, and No, uh, and I don't and, and I think that it was a deliberate Martin. slap it was a deliberate slap strategy of, of, of the Brexit position that they they had to open that door. But unfortunately now I think it's now tainted or changed what people view conservatism as and I don't know how they then close that door and I don't know how opposition parties also don't get pulled into that debate but I think it was inadvertent that that happened and now the, compl- the political landscape has completely changed the yes, result you know, what conservatism is has changed. I, I, well, it was very interesting looking at what Dominic Cummings had to say about Nigel Farage and Aaron Banks and the rest of them in the earlier days of yes, the yeah. referendum because uh, he really sort of was repelled by them and, and their nativism. But as as the campaigns went on, I think it became clearer and clearer to him that there was no way they were going to get over the line without that constituency, without that UKIPI vote. And therefore, by the final weekend, he was spending all the money they had on Facebook adverts that could have been ripped straight out of the leave.eu EU playbook and and that is the unleashing that you describe you, you don't get to blow another whistle and summon it back to the kennel do you it's out no. there and once no, it's once exactly. it's torn up membership of the European Union or torn up free movement it needs to find something else to tear up whether it's the European Convention on Human Rights or or food banks of course which came under attack from 30p Lenoch not that long ago the only the only thing that i think is something that is of their own making is that the the kind of conservative broad church probably didn't in the last 30 40 years expand its appeal to a wider voter set so that what happened is you've got a growing contingent of the conservative parliamentary party but also conservative voters that carried this cultural view and weren't willing to to have this policy debate that we've had traditionally because they didn't have a a multiplicity of, of views within their own party and so what happened was that contingent even if they weren't willing to debate this on a policy level they were just loud enough that they had to be listened to and then that then is extended to the debate in political discourse with the public as to you know the rights and wrongs of supporting brexit or whatever make everything quite binary exactly and so all of this leads to they've opened you know david cameron essentially did it but they've opened this back door to to actually something far greater than where the conservative party is now and what it represents but conservatism in general and i do wonder whether they can ever close that door fascinating analysis and i'd go a tiny little bit further um and 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 suggest that opening that door also involved a sort of subversion of reality Uh, you know a denial of observable reality or objective truth similar to what we saw in america where kellyanne conway talks about alternative facts and uh, and in this country we have somebody like uh, andrea jenkins apparently utterly detached from what the rest of us would recognize as, as as reality and johnson was a big part of that cameron wasn't but johnson was a famous liar that was his career. I was with uh, a journalist yesterday, a very august and authoritative journalist who was in Brussels as a, as a correspondent, a senior correspondent, when Johnson arrived there for the Telegraph. And he began to lie and lie and lie again. And by the time he left Downing Street, I think an awful lot of the Conservative Party had forgotten what the truth looked like. And I'd add to what Sammy said by saying how they get back to recognising what the truth looks like, I do not know, because Rishi Sunak talks about professionalism, accountability and integrity when almost every step of his premiership has involved the polar opposite of all three. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 22 minutes after 11 is the time. They do know what the truth is, James. You, you have to know what the truth is in order to lie about it. That is why they're all so desperate not to face it, whether it's austerity, Brexit, coronavirus, Liz Truss, and at the last, Rishi Sunak, who faces a general election where perhaps a nation will face up to the legacy of 13 years rather than lie to themselves. Uh, the question for voters is, is it preferable to lie to yourself or face up to the legacy of the last 13 years? It's a very pertinent question. You should have signed your text. I could have blown some smoke up your uh, fundament. Um, 
22 minutes after 11 is the time. I, 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 I would like to ask this, but I don't think that I have enough people prepared to ring me who would fit themselves into the category that I'm about to describe. I would like to ask whether or not Estimate Vey is a big enough gammon maypole to fill the space left by Suella Baverman. So it's clear that Rishi Sunak has appointed her as a, as a, as a sort of um, rallying point for gammonati. And by gammonati, we mean people of any creed or colour who essentially hate foreigners um, and all the rest of the very lazy uh, sub-son male rhetoric, hate single mothers, foreigners, taxes. Um, he's clearly appointed her as a, as a focal point or a rallying point for the Gamanati, but Suella Braverman had taken things to a whole new level. I think that, oddly, her, it's not her comments about peaceful protesters or her incitement of far-right hooliganism. It was the sort of very odd pronouncement about homeless people and tents that just signaled a move for me a paradigm shift and that was a very big space she was an enormous gammon maypole so Ella Bradman, possibly the biggest gammon maypole that we've seen in the conservative party nigel farage of course remains the biggest gammon maypole of them all but he's going to be busy eating ostrich anuses for the next few weeks so we can leave him out of our pontifications but if if suella braverman was the biggest gammon maypole in recent memory, probably the biggest gammon maypole since Enoch Powell, will Esther McVeigh be a big enough gammon maypole to fill enough of the space vacated by Suella Braverman to make her appointment worthwhile for Rishi Sunak? Because, of course, while the gammon is busy dancing around the gammon maypole, they can't come after him as leader. Although Andrea Jenkins did submit her letter of no confidence to the leader of the 1922 committee yesterday, and I think I probably should read it to you in its entirety. This woman, was she an education minister at one point? I must, I can't, I can't, I mean, it, it, if I say it's barely literate, then I would probably be understating the awfulness of this letter. I mean, not, writing to the chair of the 1922 committee in barely literate prose is one thing. But being so dumb that you don't realise how barely literate your prose is and think it would be a good idea to therefore make public the letter that you have sent is quite extraordinary. I mention Andrea Jenkins because she clearly doesn't feel that Esther McVeigh is a big enough gammon maypole to fill the space le left by Suella Braverman. But that might be because she herself has ambitions to become a gammon maypole. She could have been the uh, woke finder general in Rishi Sunak's current administration. But on we go. I will read you that letter. It is extraordinary. And it's another mark. If I ever do an appendix for how they broke Britain, things like this letter from, I think, a former education minister are uh, yet more evidence of just how low we've been brought and how appalling the puddle from which political appointments must now be made has become. Nick's in Norwich. Nick, what would you like to say? I'd like to say, mate, nice. Thanks, thanks for having me on your radio show. Very um, well. I'd just like to say that the Conservatives haven't changed. They've always been like this. There's nothing different about them than there was in the 80s or whenever they've been. It's just that they don't really care anymore if people see them for what they are. They know they're losing the next election. The people in charge now, I mean, none of them are elected, hardly any of them. <laughs> their, their ideology is to destroy the welfare state and take as much as they can out of taxes because taxes are just pure socialism, which works nicely for everyone, and they don't need to benefit from the taxes, so they see it as something that they afford, can pay on. We can afford to pay. Yes, but I mean, that, and then, of course, it's the Anirin Bevin quote about persuading Labour to use its political power to keep wealth in power, isn't it? Because most people would be in all sorts of trouble if, uh, if A, the welfare state was dismantled, and B, taxation was massively reduced, because most of us are, are, are net takers from the system rather than net givers, but they managed to persuade people. I got a text here, actually, from Scott, and I do not know, Nick, whether it's a joke or not. He says, James, I vote Conservative because one day I might be rich. Which is well, no, 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 I, I work. I mean, I work. I drive around all day. But I, honestly, I don't think that Labour are that close. It depends where those polls come from. I mean, you mm. meet people all day, and, and they seem to think that everything's wonderful, and I just don't understand where they get it from. I don't meet people like that. 
Was this oh, in, I do. I was in Norwich yeah. last week. I didn't meet anyone who thinks everything, although it was probably a yeah, slightly self-selecting crowd, given that they'd paid to come and thing. see me. I mean, I laugh when you say, oh, you know, get people to phone up. There's not many people like me that drive around all day, listen to you, then Nick Ferrar, Nick Ferrar, oh, there are. You. There's, there's and mid- the next day... There, there, there's loads, actually. So, but ringing so? in makes you weird. I'm, no offence. Oh. <laughs> it's a very tiny proportion of the audience that actually pick up the phone and ring in. But let's not no, get yeah. let's not get distracted. I, 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 I would... I think cite John Major in opposition to your thesis. John Major, I think, was a good conservative. Oh, potentially. I mean, I moved here, you know, during the Blair Blair years from South Africa. And uh, it was beautiful, you know, when I got here. The place was lovely. And um, I remember the Boers in South Africa. They were always amazed that British people would vote for Thatcher, who was a big supporter of apartheid. She was, yes. And um, protest in the streets against apartheid. And at that's the what David time. Cameron, yeah. I mean, I'll correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he used to call for Nelson Mandela to, and mm, um, steady used to on. burn I, money in, I, I you have to look it up. I, well, yeah, and, but you've said it on the radio now, so yeah, you put well, me in a slightly uncomfortable position. Sorry, mate. That's and all right. I, I just, just to be, Club. No, I'm familiar with his, um, I'm f- familiar with his what's it chops his Bullingdon Club days. In fact, I write yeah. about them a bit in the book in, in, in how they broke Britain, but he, he, I don't think Cameron... I've not got Cameron saying anything like that about Nelson Mandela, I don't think. I believe, but I could obviously be wrong, that he used to run Don't repeat it. Don't, don't repeat it. During yeah. Thatcher's time in office, members of the Federation of Conservative Students went as far as wearing stickers declaring hang Nelson Mandela. There we go. So until the group was from. banned in 1986 by an embarrassed Tory leadership. John Burko was the head of the Federation of Conservative Students at the time. He's been on quite a journey in the intervening years, but there is no evidence that the young David Cameron was involved. Fair enough, but it just points to my statement. No, no, it does. Yeah, you've got got the wrong Tory. You've got the wrong Tory. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Nick. Uh, But I still offer up John Major and, you know, some of the more obvious and possibly slightly simplistic uh, examples as well, uh, Rory Stewart, most obviously, who, who, who did great things at the Foreign Office. His book is incredibly cutting on David Cameron, by the way, which is pertinent. It's significant because Sunak's doing that thing. He's clicking his heels together and saying, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. He's trying to dream things better. I think there's an aha lyric, actually. I dream myself alive. They don't get the credit they deserve for their philosophical um, aperçu, aha. But uh, he's trying to dream things better, uh, ignoring the fact, the facts, plural, of David Cameron's record and of the testimony of people like Rory Stewart about what, what he was really like with regard to foreign policy when he was prime minister. I shall read you Andrea Jenkins' letter after this. Um, Why don't you go make yourself a cup of tea? It's half past 11. Thomas Watts has your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 11.34 and you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Now, Sam, I'm going to read your message out and I'm going to answer your question. But I don't want to set a precedent by which you're going to think that you can get this level of bespoke personal treatment every time you tune in. Because you mentioned this is the first time you've listened. But it caught my eye. About one in a hundred texts catch my eye because they just scroll past me so quickly. And it's pure luck. Uh, It's got absolutely no judgment whatsoever. Hello, mate. Sam from Wales here. First time listening live. Oh, okay. So you do listen on catch up. I take back some of what I just said. To settle a debate between me and a friend, did David Cameron have the sole power to add a minimum vote, a minimum percentage vote to make the Brexit referendum binding? Almost like a filibuster, I guess. I hope this makes sense. I'm not up on my political terminology. I think you might have misused the word filibuster but but yes they, they, they could have um I, I mean the binding thing's a bit of a red herring because no one technically the referendum result wasn't binding but nobody b- believed that in in either the run-up to it or the aftermath of it but yes they could as as uh, the hard man of brexit himself steve baker explained the other day with regard to a referendum a mooted referendum on a united island uh they could have had uh, a higher threshold for victory I think even Farage talked about that at one point. But, of course, as ever with him, he'll say one thing on a Monday and the polar opposite on a Tuesday. So, yeah, you'd need at least a 60% result in order for it to, to, to be binding or to be valid. He could have done that if he wanted, but he didn't. 11.36 is the time. Back to... No, hang on. I told you this. So I first came across Andrea 
Jenkins, who you've just reminded me was actually made a dame. I'm going to say something a little bit rude. So if you are of a delicate disposition, maybe just turn your radio down a bit or use Rewind, Global Player, where you are in control. Uh, Sometimes you look at some of the stuff Boris Johnson did on the way out of Downing Street and you think, why did he do that? And I think the answer is that because he can. I think he is in the same way that Andrea Jenkins flipped a finger at the British public outside Downing Street on one occasion. I think that Boris Johnson did a couple of things on the way out of Downing Street that involved flick, flicking the finger at the British public and at traditions. It was like, a, how dare you throw me out? I'm going to do something ridiculous. To pr- Right, Andrea Jenkins is going to become a dame. It's a bit like when burglars poo in the kettle on their way out of a building. I think making Andrea Jenkins a dame is Boris Johnson. It's the political equivalent of Boris Johnson doing a poo in the Downing Street kettle on his way out of the door. She first came to my attention when she tweeted something about Boris Johnson that was just quite beautifully hilarious. It is Boris who has delivered on his promises to the British people. Thank God he saved Brexit, got a majority and broke the deadlock. We now have a strong negotiating team that puts Britain's interests ahead of the EU's. And I'd never heard of her before. And I thought at first it was a parody like Rosie Holt or Sir Michael Take MP, but but it was not. So I tweeted, I cannot recommend this account highly enough. It is genuinely hilarious, a million times better than most so-called parodies. To which, remarkably, she responded by writing, Oh, Mr. Woke Man. So you see, she's furious that she's not the gammon maypole in Rishi Sunak's new government, isn't she? She's been applying for the role of gammon maypole pretty much since she arrived in Parliament. Oh, Mr. Woke Man, we will continue to take a stand against you and your anti-British, anti-free speech agenda. That's me, speaking freely on the radio for three hours every single day with my anti-free speech agenda. Socialism is not the answer. What was the question? And the time will demonstrate what a real idiot you are. That's me told. And then I, this bit you'll think I'm making up. Hashtag pro Brexit. Hashtag pro Boris. Hashtag pro Trump. Pro Trump. And then a union flag emoji. And you owe me, frankly, because that was in 2020. That was September 2020. And if you'd been following her for three years, although I think she locked her account shortly afterwards, uh, you'd have enjoyed all manner of hilarities like that, culminating in yesterday's letter of no confidence sent to Sir Graham Brett. I'm going to read it to you in its entirety, and I'm going to resist the urge to do any funny voices, because frankly, it doesn't need one. Dear Sir Graham, enough is enough. If it wasn't bad enough that we have a party leader that the party members rejected, the polls demonstrate that the public reject him and I am in full agreement. It is time for Rishi Sunak to go. Rishi's Machiavellian involvement in getting rid of our democratically elected leader Boris Johnson, who bravely fought for Brexit when Parliament was in deadlock, yes, Boris, the man who won the Conservative Party a massive majority, was unforgivable enough. That's a sentence. That's an actual sentence here. Ready? Yes, Boris, the man who won the Conservative Party a massive majority, was unforgivable enough. Between 2022 and 2022, this woman was a a minister for education and skills. Rishi's Machiavellian involvement in getting rid of our democratically elected leader, Boris Johnson, who bravely fought for Brexit when Parliament was in deadlock. Full stop. That's the sentence. Let me read it to you again, lest you've missed just how imbecilic it is in construction. Rishi's Machiavellian involvement in getting rid of our democratically elected leader, Boris Johnson, who bravely fought for Brexit when Parliament was in deadlock. Full stop. What? Next sentence. Yes, Boris. The man who won the Conservative Party a massive majority was unforgivable enough. Full stop. Something with which I would actually agree. Boris Johnson was indeed unforgivable enough for anybody, but I don't think that's what Dame, Dame Andrea Jenkins uh, intended to convey. Another sentence now. But then to purge the centre-right from his cabinet and then sack Suella, who was the only person in the cabinet with the balls to speak the truth of the appalling state of our streets and a two-tier policing system that leaves Jewish community in fear for their lives and safety. That doesn't full stop. That doesn't make any sense either. There's verbs missing, isn't there? Is it verbs? There's not enough verbs. 
Either that or she's been at the Herbs. It's hard to be sure. And the King's Speech, semicolon. There's no way she knows the correct place. She doesn't even know verbs. How could she be using a semicolon? That's quite a sophisticated piece of punctuation. And the King's Speech, semicolon. We should have had a barnstorming speech that would have strongly set out our stall ready for the general election that defines our true Conservative values. Full stop. To be 20 points plus behind in the polls and by election defeat after defeat. Full stop. That's another sentence. Seriously, capital T. To be 20 points plus behind in the polls and by election defeat and defeat. Full stop. If you were seriously primary school teachers listening to this, what would you do if someone submitted that as a sentence in a piece of written work, in a piece of composition? Year, year five, year six. To be. 20 points plus behind in the polls and by election defeat and de de defeat. New sentence. How long are MPs going to sit on their hands and let he and his out of touch advisers damage our party irrevocably? It's him, isn't it? You'd let him. I am letting him through the door. He is letting me through the door. I am letting him through the door. You wouldn't say, please let he in. Unless you are Dame Andrea Jenkins, Minister for Education and Skills from 2022 to a bit later in 2022. How long are MPs going to sit on their hands and let he and his out-of-touch advisers damage our party irrevocably? You can tell they're out of touch because they use verbs. I therefore submit this letter of no confidence in Rishi Sunak as our Conservative Party leader. That works. I do this to stand up and fight. Oh my God, not another one. Haven't we, haven't we suffered enough of conservative politicians who want to stand up and fight? Also, she's stealing Penny Mordaunt's lunch. I do this to stand up and fight for true conservatism. We must be a party that delivers low taxes, be trusted on the economy and turbocharge our skills to power our economy. Skills. Turbocharge our skills, says a woman unfamiliar with verbs. We must be strong on law and order, take control of our borders, be energy independent as a nation and stand up for our freedom of speech. I hope other Conservative MPs follow suit. This is our last chance. Hang on. I hope other Conservative MPs follow suit, comma. This is our last chance, comma. To stop Starmer, comma. The man who tried to put Jeremy Corbyn into number 10, comma. We need to stop his socialist cabal, comma who will change the face of Britain beyond recognition, full stop. It's gibberish. It's absolute gibberish. It's like, she, it's like she cut some words out of the newspaper and threw them in the air and then stuck them to a piece of paper and sent it to Rishi Sunak. Kind regards, and I wish you could see her signature. I have signed about 4,000 books in the last couple of weeks and there have been times when my signature is looking a little bit weird. But this looks like it was done while held in a fist rather than like a pen. You know, you hold a pen between your thumb and your two fingers, like that, yeah? Like that. And then, and even if you've got a bit tired, you've done 3,000 signatures in the last hour and your shoulder's hurting, you still manage to... If she did that, holding it like a pen, rather than holding it like a, like a knife, you know, not an eating knife, but a stabbing stuff knife. She's done it with a Crayola crayon. Hey, Jenkins, kiss, kiss. And that is a former Minister for Education and Skills. Like I said, a poo in a kettle. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.49. Dave the Return is Rishi renting a personality is uh, a suggestion from one of my most treasured correspondents. And I, I, I think it's both true and desperate. He is hoping that something that David Cameron, something that he believes David Cameron possesses will rub off on him. The tragedy is that whatever it is he believes David Cameron possesses, David Cameron almost certainly doesn't possess. But Rishi Sunak thinks it's something that he currently lacks, which probably is to be filed under personality. Will's in Brent. Will, you've been waiting for so long. I don't know quite where that Andrea Jenkins little uh, diversion came from. I don't regret it, Will, and I stand by every no. word, but it is possible you've forgotten why you rang in. I, I haven't, Richard, no, but I still want to tell you, I think it was very interesting, yeah, and, uh, you know, the Andrea Jenkins rant was pretty mad, wasn't it? Enough and, is uh, enough. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and after a run like that, all things were rather sad, so I had to end it with kind regard. Kind it? regards, so, yeah. Andrea Jenkins. <laughs> huge run. Yours with uh, eyes yeah. on stalks, Andrea Jenkins. Yours. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. And she had been, I was just checking parliamentary, on the Secretary of State for Skills. Skills, um, yeah. it was only under Liz Trust, so it was only for like... For no, she had, she was she, she was in there f- at the end of Johnson as well. It might have been one of those appointments oh, he made when there was literally yeah. nobody else left. Everyone else had said yeah. no or told him to resign. And he said, Andrea Jenkins, you'd make a good education minister. And then Liz Trust kept her in the job and I think added some extra words to her job description. But tell me about the modern yeah. iteration of the Tory party. Well, I think that's right. And the job description at that time, you know, became sort of, are you, have you got a sort of loud, shouty, angry voice? Yes. You're sort of, you know, How do you get it? Well, actually, you, you're, kind of, you're, you're resisting my invitation to actually return to the territory that we're supposed to be discussing. So I'll join you in the, on, the, on, the, on the tangential. And how, why, was she, why was she made a dame? Yeah, well, I don't, oh, I don't, I don't know about that one. But, but I think, I think the, the, her whole appointment is, is relevant to the debate, isn't it? Because it was about that kind of that lurch towards populism that yes. happened, particularly with, with sort of Brexit, where they realised that if they kind of adopt a sort of populist mentality, take a simplistic... It, get, it gets you over a, it gets you over a line, but it cannot yeah. possibly sustain government, can it? They don't seem exactly. to have learned that lesson. It's bizarre. Yeah, so they've ended up with these sort of two, pop, two really kind of different demographics within that coalition of conservatism now. And there's always a dem- there's always a sort of a coalition of different views. But here you sort of got quite opposing ones in a way because the, the populist one, there's, a, there's an element of kind of anti-establishment in that, isn't yes, there? Yes, yeah, of course there is. Re- rebel. And yet the traditional kind of conservative um, voter base, I think, is the core base. is very much an establishment one, isn't it? It's about... You know, retaining the, so you're trying, um, they're trying the, to, it's, it's having your cake and eating it then. It's, so we're going to put Esther McVeigh mm. there because she can pretend she's anti establishment, and we're going to put David Cameron there because they don't come any more establishment than David Cameron. And that might calm the horses works. in some, some, some corners of the Conservative Party vote. Yeah, and it only works if you can just talk separately to different sections of that population, which maybe they were able to do a little bit via social media and those sort of days where uh, you're talking uh, through Facebook, yeah. etc. Uh, but I don't know whether it works now, whether they, they can still do that. It must be what they're thinking that they can still do. But it is a sort of pretty massive gulf now between that. that yeah, sort of no, you're right. There's two the parties there, the, the two or two extremities of the same party. It's not a great phone line, Will, so I, I shall crack on with your permission. But the idea of somebody who holds David Cameron and Andrea Jenkins or... Suella Braverman, but most pertinently given yesterday's reshuffle, someone who holds David Cameron and Esther McVeigh in high regard. What would that person look like? Apart from the, the, the people who don't care who, who it is, they are besotted with the rosette, with the blue rosette. But, but someone thoughtful who can simultaneously hold David Cameron and Esther McVeigh in high regard. Because if those people don't exist then the question of what the Tory party stands for or even looks like today becomes even more urgent. A quick apology to Andy, who, who writes, please stop making me laugh when I'm in the gym lifting weights. You should see me in the gym lifting weights, Andy. That would make you laugh. 11.53 is the time. Uh, another Andy. This one is in Peterborough. Andy, what would you like to say? Hi, mate. Um, first of all, uh, good afternoon. I hope the day finds you and yours well. That's very kind um, of you. Yeah, I'm a lifelong Tory voter. Yes. Um, I have been... Like, For your whole life. life. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but the appointment of David Cameron is kind of shocking, really. Why? Well, because he's he's spineless. Well, hang on. I mean, how lifelong are you a Tory voter? Because he's, he's 13 years ago, mate. Well, lifelong, but I never agreed with his appointment in the first place. But right, but you the, voted the, the for thing him. Is, the thing is, listen, it's jobs for the listening. boys, isn't it? I'm just it's, checking. It's you did vote boys. for him twice, did you? I did. Yeah. Uh, but Vote spineless. Then, you know, it's it's red versus blue, isn't it? It's that kind of thing. Well, you said um, it. Yeah, it's red versus blue, but it's, okay. you know, it's yeah. just the way that I was so, brought up. But so better, is, better a spineless prime minister than a, than a good one? Uh... Well, that's yep. arguable, isn't it? Yeah, yeah fair enough. <laughs> so go on, why, why, why the appointment? I mean, so who do you like then, Andy? Uh, to be completely honest with you, the next the next election, I'm voting for Labour. Okay. The Tories have lost my vote completely. They don't stand for anything, and the appointment of David Cameron is 
laughable, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, he hasn't even stood as a member of parliament since 2016. No. And remember, this is the guy, and I'm not going to swear on air because I don't want to get you in trouble. But thank you, I appreciate um, that. But this is the guy that it was widely reported in the wake of the Brexit vote. The next day, he said to his aides in number 10, why should I do the yeah. expressive deleted hard bit? Yeah. I, I, had, you know, I had some sympathy for that, in a way. But when you learn that Ireland were putting preparations for the UK leaving the European Union in place as early as 2013 and David Cameron did diddly squat in mm-hmm. the same period then my uh, my sympathy dissipated somewhat because he, he, you know if you call a referendum and your prime minister you should really be preparing the ground for both results shouldn't you of course yeah so the, the scale of the he job he, yeah, he, he ran he did run he ran yeah, but and, I, hang and on. Now, I mean, all of a sudden he's back in as, as foreign secretary. What has he done in the meantime? To, to well, he a, made a few million quid from a company that went bust after he tried to get them some cushy loans from the government by sending special texts to Rishi Sunak asking for um, special yeah. treatment. Uh, uh, yeah, and also, he wrote that's, a book in a sh- he wrote a book in a shepherd's hut. He, it's strange that he got a peerage as well, isn't it? Mm. Well, he needs a peerage to be. Well, kind of needs a peerage to be in cabinet. I'm just going to pick you up on one thing. Go for it. Did you vote for Brexit? You don't have to tell me. No, I didn't. I oh, okay. voted against it. Okay. But I don't think that he campaigned hard enough against no, it. No, I don't think that he campaigned hard enough either. But but if if he'd tried to stay, I think mm. that I think that the pro Brexit wing of the Tory party would have torn him to shreds. Uh, that that I think is not in defence of his cowardice, mm-hmm. but in defence of his decision. I, I, I genuine. I mean, imagine what. You know, he was he was left in an untenable position. Yeah, exactly. But the thing is, he didn't campaign hard enough and or try to convince people that you know this is actually this could actually be a really bad idea. But let's not, you know. No, let's, when let's not, I was looking at his tweets this. yesterday because I'm weird like that, and and his tweets about the economy, they were getting like six or seven hundred likes. And I, I know mm. this was uh, seven years ago, but it's still. Uh, you know, a very odd, very muted campaign. And, of course, the fellow leading the Labour Party at the time was measurably worse, even worse than David Cameron leading the Conservative when it came to campaigning for Remain. So not for the first one, time. It's a, it's one a, of the things that sort of dis, disillusioned... Sorry to cut you off, mate. That's all right. One of, the things, um, one, one of the things that... Sort of, this is where the disillusionment, I guess, began with my relationship with the Tory party um, was an episode of Question Time. Yeah. And there was a geezer on there, um, looked to be like mid forties, fifties, van driver type. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Sure. And he turned around and said to David Cameron, "After Brexit, when are they going back? Like we're just going to deport right. a million? I don't remember Eastern this. European immigrants. Yeah, yeah, it happened, bro. No, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with the with the sentiment i just don't remember the specific yeah, episode but of he, question yeah, he said what he said when are they going back right and it's like hang on well this yeah. something's gone very very wrong here with the, your message and something's gone very so very, that's very what he here. thought they had promised to deliver that didn't he yeah and he didn't arrive at thought. he didn't arrive at that position by accident either that was that was no, absolutely not, that's no. the tiger they rode i think to get brexit no. over the line and it would have been had i been a traditional conservative voter it would have been a moment for me as well andy and in fact you you, you bring us to the end of the hour and the end of that conversation with another uh, reminder albeit that you're now planning to vote labor that the loneliest people in British politics at the moment are, are the kind of people who are if you like fiscal and e- even social conservatives but not driven by nativism, jingoism, xenophobia, racism, whatever you prefer to call it, they're not driven by that. So all of Suella Braverman's pronouncements about such issues would would just drive you ever further away from the party. And yet David Cameron's appointment isn't going to draw you back at all because of his record and, in Andy's words, his spinelessness. And we haven't even mentioned the Panama Papers, which... um, provided a little bit more of an insight into some of the financial arrangements of his family. It's coming up to 12 noon. Up next, schools are being urged to celebrate working class cultural heroes. James O'Brien on LBC. It is three minutes after 12 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC where we turn our attention next to 
Uh, a subject that fits very neatly into some of my favourite territory uh, that we explore during our time together. I am fascinated by social mobility, as you know, and, and by class. Class is relevant to the conversations that we've already had this morning, because imagine if David Cameron had been born on a council estate in Sunderland, for example, or Wolverhampton or Glasgow or wherever you prefer, the same DNA, the same person, the same skills, the same attributes, the same intelligence levels, but none of the opportunities, none of the privileges, none of the inheritance. Where do you think he would be today? Hand on heart. Let's just take a moment to think about that. Some people rise from uh, poverty to achieve greatness, but it is a much more common journey to plot a relatively horizontal course through life, or indeed to start on the loftier rungs of our society and scale a few more. Where would David Cameron be today if he had been born to a single mother, let's just go all in on the cliches, if he'd been born to an unemployed single mother on a council estate in Sunderland or Birmingham or Slough. You see, that's all. That's all you have to do. You just have to engage in that little simple mental exercise. You can play the same game with Boris Johnson if you want. Uh, or yourself, actually. Or me. And that's the class system. That is the system that we live in. That is the country. That is why uh, two authors of a, of a new report called The Working Classroom dismiss the notion of meritocracy and describe it as smoke and mirrors. Social mobility essentially involves lifting a few working class children, they argue, away from their identity. And they're right. They're just right. If you're struggling with that, I'd be. I wasn't expecting you to actually submit suggestions as to what David Cameron would be doing now. But whoever sent in an unlicensed bookie, James, has just really done the imagination. Where did you get that from? Uh, George in Chelsea suggests he'd be managing a Tesco Express. Um, I'm going unlicensed bookie is is just absolutely brilliant. Um, but I wasn't meaning that as an actual exercise in what do you think David Cameron would be doing if we'd been born to a single mother on a council estate in Sunderland. I just wanted you to recognise something that I'm very conscious of in my life, and that is the role that privilege and advantage plays. And I'm conscious of it for, for two reasons, I think. Number one is that my parents made it clear to me how much advantage was being bestowed upon me by dint of the education that they paid for. There are other advantages in life, and uh, I got those too, actually. I got all of the love and security that, that a child could wish for. But I think, and oddly, Stuart Lee asked me about this the other night when, when, when he um, interviewed me for the new book. And Stuart's, Stuart's adopted as well. And I think there's a duality to the adopted child's existence. Subconsciously, you don't notice it all the time. But I would have been raised by an unemployed single mother in rural Ireland in the 1970s if I hadn't been adopted. So that little exercise in imagination that I just encouraged you to play with David Cameron, I don't need to play it. I, that was me. That was me with the same DNA, with the same intelligence levels with the with the same attributes with the same latent skills or learning but i was adopted so i grew up where i grew up and went to the schools that i went to so ben and exeter suggest he'd be a pig farmer you're going to have to stop this now i'm trying to set up an intelligent phone-in show and you keep making me giggle <laughs> it's an unlicensed bookie or a pig farmer that wasn't true by the way that story um and, and, and so I don't struggle. I, 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 you know, I find it really, really easy to say, crikey, cool, accidents of birth make a big difference, don't they? Because it's just so obviously true. And yet apparently it isn't obviously true because lots of people deny it. Lots of people who were born 3-0 up truly believe that they've scored a hat-trick in their lives. Do you remember when we talked about the uh, abolition of tax breaks for public schools, for private schools, that Keir Starmer is intending to introduce and every time you do that topic you get a call from from someone who insists a 
that they're very hard working, as if parents who can't afford to t- send their children to private school somehow are less hard working. And B, and this is the bit that drives me bonkers, they deny that it bestows any advantage. They can't quite admit that that people like them and me and my parents pay this money to accrue an unfair advantage for our children. But they, they, well, so first of all, they claim it's not unfair, but it might be an advantage because I work bloody hard, right? And then when that falls apart under questions about, I don't know, people doing a night shift in a hospital or, or, or people putting in an incredible graft in return for a much smaller salary, so you can no longer claim that it's perfectly fair then you have to claim there's no advantage. So someone is literally looking you in the eye and telling you they're paying 20, 30 grand a year to send their child to a school, but they're not expecting any educational advantage to be accrued. You're not expecting better exam results as a consequence or better social connections or better, I don't know, lacrosse skills. And, and you, so, so you simply say, well, why are you sending them to that school then? Unless you're buying something. And yet this country, more than all, any other that I've got any experience of or knowledge of, persists in, in portraying privilege as earned rather than bestowed randomly by an accident of birth. So who would David Cameron be today if he'd grown up with a single mother on a council estate in Liverpool? Ten minutes after 12 is the time. That's just a little bit of backdrop to calls from these authors, uh, one a former teacher, both from working class backgrounds, for schools to do more to raise standards among disadvantaged children and recognise their rich heritage. Now, I need to explain this right, because it tallies oddly with something that I've felt for some time, but as an avowedly middle class man... I feel a little bit uncomfortable wading into this territory. So I'm grateful to Matt Bromley and Andy Griffith for arguing in the working classroom that every school's curriculum should celebrate working class culture alongside the culture of dominant classes. Um, In other words, working class culture or working class children and I'm never entirely clear on what we mean by that, but generally speaking, we just mean these days at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. White working class boys uh, in recent years have become the poorest performers in classrooms. When I started in this job, it was poor black kids. I'll tell you something funny about the right wing media. When poor black kids were at the bottom of the educational attainment tree, it was all the fault of the parents. Right? No doubt about it. All the fault of the parents. Now poor white kids are at the bottom of the educational attainment tree. It's all the fault of uh, positive discrimination or inverse racism or the system or wokeness. Woke teachers. Funny that, isn't it? Poor black kids at the bottom of the tree. It's all the fault of the black parents. Poor white kids at the bottom of the tree. It's all the fault of woke teachers. You'd have to take it up with people who pursue both of those positions to try to work out what it is that lies at the heart of such an apparent contradiction. But what I find depressing, and, and, and the thing that I'm uncomfortable saying as a middle-class man, is that we always portray the working class in this country as something to be escaped from. The success stories involve people making good. They, they involve people leaving behind their roots. The working class success stories are about people achieving middle class status or people breaking out of the expectations of their birth. And we never read a celebration of working class culture. Do we? So what would that celebration look like? What would that celebration look like? Um, some of the things that are suggested, and I want you to make suggestions as well, but, but I'll tell you the other question that I'm going to ask in, in just a moment. You look at something like Great Expectations by Charles Dickens, but Great Expectations is a story of social mobility, isn't it? It's not a story of, I suppose, Pip, in a way, his relationship with Charles Gargery, Gargery does, does celebrate working class culture in a way but you'd rather read a Roddy Doyle or a Douglas Stewart I think This Land is Your Land by Woody Guthrie is an absolutely beautiful piece of folk music um, talking about essentially about land rights they, they mentioned the Eaton Rifles by The Jam which is about class conflict Ghost Town by The Specials um, I don't know what the examples would be 
on this. I don't know what examples you would choose, but I'll, I'll read you something that these authors wrote. Social mobility implies lifting students out of the working classes and leaving behind all that they are and identify with. Rather, the aim of equity in education is to celebrate and embrace students' working class roots while simultaneously ensuring those roots don't take a stranglehold of their life chances. I can feel the rectitude of this in my bones. I really can. It just feels so beautifully apposite to me. And yet, I can't think of powerful examples of what it would actually look like, which is where you come in. This is where you come in. There are two questions here. The first is, how, how do you celebrate? Who are working class cultural heroes that are not vulnerable to the description of having essentially left their roots behind? Have a think about this. I, I, I think it's very tricky. Doesn't mean you have to give all your money away. You know, John Lennon sang about working class heroes and I guess in many ways remained one even as he was living in the Dakota building in New York and had millions of pounds in the bank. So we need to pinpoint what it is that makes somebody retain working class hero status despite having moved up the socio-economic ladder quite violently in some cases. Who, who would they be? It's Joe, not Charles. Where did I get Charles from? Thank you, Liz. Um, oh, it's Charles Dickens, isn't it? So, there you go, yeah. <laughs> so what, what, who, who would they be? 03456060973. But also, how, how do you understand this? This idea that there are not, cultural moments that celebrate somebody from a working class background who stays working class. They, they mentioned Billy Elliot and train spotting, Dolly Parton and Charles Dickens as celebrators, celebrants, if you like, of working class culture. What, what are the great examples of working class cultural heroes? And how do we... So I've got to get this right. How, how do... What, yeah, what does it look like when you retain working class cultural hero status despite not being poor anymore, okay? I don't know if I've set this up right. Um, I'll level with you. I think I have, and I, I find it incredibly powerful personally because I think that uh, the, the, the greatest tragedy of being born English is the notion that you should know your place. I usually quote at this point that hymn that we all sang in school without knowing what the unsung verse said about the rich man in his castle the poor man at his gate god made them high and lowly and ordered their estate as if it is god's will that jacob rees mogg rides around on a penny farthing while other people are using a food bank it's not a consequence of human conditioning it's not a consequence of deliberately imposed inequality it's not a consequence of our class system it's god's will i think that's the single most depressing and dismal thing about being born english is the subscription to that school of thought but i don't know what i'd point to first as proof of what these authors are describing who 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 is a working class cultural hero and how do you hang on to working class culture or working class values as you make your way up the socio-economic ladder um the reason i say i don't know whether i've set this up right or not is because I, I can't quite yet imagine what you're going to say when you call me which means you might not call me at all in which case we'll probably go back to andrea jenkins letter of no confidence in rishi sunak just for comedy value but i'd really like to get stuck into this i've talked for 15 minutes and i've said a lot of words Take from those words whatever meaning you want and answer whatever question you please. There is something here about working class culture being portrayed almost everywhere as something to be triumphantly escaped. Whereas I think, and these authors think, that that's probably the wrong way round. And in fact, if you come from that background, you should have aspiration, but it shouldn't involve abandoning your background or seeing it as something to be escaped from discuss 03456060973 james o'brien on lbc 
James O'Brien on LBC. 21 minutes after 12. What does it mean? What does it mean that schools, when we urge schools to celebrate working class cultural heroes, what do you think that would look like? Anna's in Aldershot. Anna, what would you like to say? Hello. Um, thank you for letting me um, talk on your show today. First time caller, so a bit nervous. It's only um, me. Take your time. Seriously. OK. So my so we live in Aldershot. Um, mm. I can't work because I've got long term illnesses and my husband works full time. Okay. I used to work in a big corporate company for 20, 20 years. Right. Um, and so we have very limited income coming in. Um, my son has been offered a full fully funded place in a private school um, which is amazing completely life changing opportunity Um, but there are issues that come with that because obviously we have to as parents instill that he's very grounded and he understands and he realises where he's come from and that he's surrounded by lots and lots of privileged children and lots of privileged families, lots of famous families Mm. Um, and I think it's just important, it's the parents responsibility to guide them and also uh, make them realise and understand where they're grounded and where they come from, and and he's he appreciates every opportunity that he's been given, um, and gets frustrated that some of the other children don't take those opportunities. Yes, um, but he was, you know, he's been given opportunities in sport, and he's now excelled, and he was um, called, you know, called up for England trials, sure. um, and that would never have happened if he had not have gone there. Mm. But I think there is a little bit of a disconnect because. He's been in there for two years. He's joined, he's in his second year now. So I think the first year, and it might have just been because of his age, but he was turning his location off on his phone so his friends couldn't see where he lived oh. at the weekends when he'd come home. Oh. Um, and it might just be a teenage thing, I don't know. But um, How, also yeah. from did you talk my to point... Did, did you talk to him about that? Or did you just yeah, let, yeah. What did he and say? I, and I said to him, I think it's just your age, but I think... As you get older, you'll actually fully appreciate the opportunities that you've been given, yeah. and you'll get to a point where you'll say, "I don't care." Um, and he's be- he's kind of at that stage now, going into sort of year ten. Mm. And he said to me, "I don't." I said to him, "You know, we're going to this charity event where they're raising money for the foundation that actually funds him." Yes. And I said, "I'm going to I'm going to see a lot of your friends' parents there, yeah. so they're probably going to put two and two together and work out." that you're being funded by this foundation scheme. Right. And he said, I don't care. Good for and him. so, um, do you believe he him? wouldn't, yeah, I do. Good. Yeah. Cause he's, he's massively matured. Um, but I think also we've got two other children. And so it's trying to explain to them why he's been given that opportunity can't and be. we can't afford to give it to them. Mm. So, um, the school has said to us, that they don't really want to cause any ri- uh, sibling rivalry. And so they said, when it comes to it, they may consider taking them in as well. Sure. Um, but it's... It's um, it's a funny one, isn't it? It is really difficult. But I think it's really important that the parents instill good, good fundamentals into their children. You know, if my child grows up to be an honest, caring, kind respectful person mm. then I've done a good job you know and I, and I think because this is my middle son he's very driven and he's very competitive yes. and he will always want to be the best he can be I know that he may have he may have excelled anyway in whatever environment he's in but he's you know they've just given him an opportunity of a lifetime and they've just opened doors for him um now, here's and the it, thing, because you, you, I hope you'll allow me to say that you sound fantastic. You sound like you are navigating this very tricky territory as close to perfect as anyone could hope. It is, it's really tricky. I yeah. know, I, get, I, get, I do understand that, but, but everything you said s- 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 speaks of care, concern and carefulness. And, 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 I, and it, I, you know, God knows how hard it is being a parent and there's no such thing as a perfect one, but it sounds to me like you're getting absolutely everything right. The, the word we haven't used yet is fairness, isn't it? And we've kind of touched on it a bit with your other two. But you, 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 do you teach him that his advantage is unfair? Um, or does he understand that implicitly himself? He, he understands that he's been given a fantastic opportunity and that his other brothers, his, old, his older brother is now at Winchester Uni. Okay. Um, and he's, 
doing amazingly oh, and he he really struggled when he was at GCSE because he lost his dad to terminal cancer mm. so we had a lot of sort of all the emotionals up and down yes. and I had to give him a different support yes, of so course. every child all needs something different you know my little one's really into theatre and he loves singing and dancing and, and all of that and we just me and my husband have just said you know like I I will do as much as I can with my health issues but Mm. We don't have a lot of money, but we give everything to our children. So and is, I think is, that's... Is, is that is that the, the, the? I mean, there's going to be multiple answers to this question, but you see, again, it leads us back into that slightly strange territory, doesn't it? Of of there'll be plenty of kids at your children's school, at your boys' school, who are also being taught that they're in receipt of an epic privilege, an epic advantage, even though their parents are paying for it. I was. My parents paid for my education, and I was very, very conscious of the the exceptional nature of that advantage and, and how lucky I was. And there'll be some who think it's their birthright. Um, they might end up, for example, foreign secretary, uh, it, it, with a belief that somehow they were born to rule, that there's, that, that there's nothing extraordinary or undeserved about these advantages that are being bestowed. But what what precisely are you teaching your son to hold on to um i think i just that's a really really good question um just the values of of respect and honesty and and um that in life you have to work for what you get yeah you have to work hard for what you get yeah. and that i've always said you know, I worked ever since I was 16 years of age and I worked up until I couldn't work anymore. Um, but I, I just, I, I've always taught my children that, you you know, you if you work hard, then you'll get rewarded. And if you're a decent person, then, you know, you, you'll build the right friendships and you'll build the right connections and, and you'll progress in life. But the most important thing to me is that they're happy. And if they're happy and they're healthy, then fundamentally that's amazing the rest, but the, I, the, the rest will follow although i not a lot of that is is, is specifically working class I, it, it's more sort of human isn't it or humanist but I, I but i stress i think i think you're getting it all as close to bang on as you possibly can and yet you know the the the, the sense of moving up through the ranks taking you further away from where you started is is always going to be hard to to resist or possibly even impossible to avoid um Thank you, Anna, and, and good luck to all of you. It's coming up to half past 12. I've just remembered I've get, got a guest at 12.45, so we're not going to be able to take a, 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 a tiny fraction of all the calls that have come in on this. It's my fault, sorry. Um, we may return to it on, a, on another occasion. Uh, time now, though, for the very latest news headlines with Amelia Cox. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.33 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um... I, I sort of, it's a weird one. I know what it is and I know what I think, but I can't quite get the words out. Social mobility versus celebrating working class cultural heroes. The idea that if you're working class, an awful lot of the cultural input and influence you receive is telling you to break out of your background. How can you break out of your background while retaining loyalty to it or love of it or values from it? Anne Marie is in Kazanluk in Kazanlak in Bulgaria. Anne Marie, what would you like to say? Hello, um, um, James. James. Hello. Nice to speak to you again. Right, yeah. How are you? <laughs> um, I'm fine, thank you. Um, I had two working class heroes who I was thinking who, who didn't um, who celebrated their working class culture. Hmm. It's L.S. Lowry. Yeah. And John Cooper Clark. Yeah, I'd take both of those. And and what you're, I mean, the re also for, the it's a bit I controversial for for a Scouser because they're both Mancunians, aren't they? I think Larry was yeah, they're both but from it doesn't Salford. Matter. No, I know, I'm teasing. Yeah, but they, 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 as I say, they, they celebrated working class culture. I mean, you look at the paintings of Lowry, it's the factories, it's the football matches, it's uh, it's it's uh, that community that he was celebrating. And when he was offered a nice old, he said, "No, you're all right. I'll, I'll, I'll pass on that one. <laughs> I don't need it." The thing and I'd... the same with John Cooper. John Cooper Clark. I mean, he celebrates his accent. He celebrates the rhythms of the of the language yes. and 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 the themes of working class life. And you know, I, in in terms of we we don't celebrate those those individuals enough in schools. I th no, I, I can't really argue with that because they're, they're probably neither of them on curriculums. Lowry probably gets more 
cultural respect than John Cooper Clark does. Although for people who don't know, John, John, John Cooper Clark is a is an absolute polymath, isn't he? Rock star, indeed, <laughs> comedian, poet, most obviously perhaps, and and just all round all round genius. So what is it that we're picking on here? It's a, it's the actual subject matter of their work that puts them into the category you're describing as much as anything else. Indeed, yeah, because it, it, it's it's a case of, I, I'm, as you know for, from previous conversations, I love art and I love poetry and I will celebrate all forms of it. But it, when it comes to um, identifying specific working class mm. themes, it tends to be overlooked. It doesn't happen, And I'm does thinking, it? you know, it doesn't. And I was thinking, you know, if, if you go back to... Um, Here's a, here's a name for you, Lenin, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. Yes. He said, art belongs to the people. He did. It doesn't belong to a particular class. It belongs to everybody and all the various um, nuances of life. It, all of it needs to be celebrated and it, all of it needs to be... You know, accents, for instance, is another one. Yes. You know, with some mobility, people lose their accents. They feel the need that they have to abandon their accents. Why? It well, you know why it's a, tra- it's a it's it's a transaction. Mean- you're 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 you're, you're second guessing snobbery, really, aren't you? When you when you abandon your accent, I, 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 but it's I, ingrained I, in the Br- in British culture. You you know it's English. A case of, the, the, the further the further I get up the, the the ladder, I need to abandon a little bit more of my accent. I need to you know it's. Well, I don't. It you're not doing a very matter. good job of it, Anne Marie. If you don't mind me saying not so. Not with me, they're not now. <laughs> as I say, it, doesn't, it wouldn't matter where I lived. I would always maintain my Scouse accent. Yes. And Strangely enough, my Scouse accent helped me with my degree. I did Russian language, and I was just uh, having a discussion with a very high-ranking Russian official once, yeah. and he said, do you know you speak Russian with a beautiful accent? Is that right? Is that yeah. right? Fascinating. How, um... Because we have the... And the, we roll our R's, and it makes, it makes the pronunciation of Russian much easier. It lends itself to speaking Russian. That's sensational. What? How, how important is the... So what we're talking about is, and you've just picked up on this actually, it's not making any effort to disguise where you come from is going to be quite a big part of staying true to your roots, isn't it? It is, it is. But you could still, because John Cooper, Clark and Lowry, I don't think they particularly enjoy the trappings of the wealth that they've earned, certainly in Lowry's case. I think he stayed in very... Humble circumstances. Humble, I've got, I've humble got house, it in my yeah. head that he stayed living in the house he grew up in, but I may have dreamt that he or did. imagined it. Did he? How important yeah. is that? Because I don't. I, I think I can think of rock stars or sports stars that have stayed true to their roots, but also enjoy the trappings of the enormous wealth that they've earned. Well, I think it, 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 it's the seduction of wealth, isn't it? I think that mm. that's the problem. Is it's, it's very similar when you get MPs going into the Houses of Parliament. Yes. And they go in with good intentions, and then they, you know they arrive in the palace, and it's like, oh. Oh, this is nice. Uh, yeah, I call it the Hogwarts and, effect. Actually, it, yeah, it, it's 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 it, it, it's very very seductive. Um, you know, and so you begin it, to think you're to the manner born. Yes, and you begin to think that you're to the manner born, it. don't you? I love that. That's yeah. strong. Thanks, Anne Marie. Uh, yeah, and that's a, that 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 has really helped me get a bit closer to understanding what the heck I'm talking about in this hour. Twelve thirty nine is the time. Um, Vicky's in Shrewsbury. Vicky, what would you like to say? I've got a few. Um, sort of uh, unconnected thoughts. Welcome to my world. Coherent. Welcome to my world. <laughs> so my first thought was Keir Starmer celebrating his, celebrates his father's work, as uh, far as I remember. And he means it. He does mean yeah. it. I've seen yeah. that happen in the flesh, and there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, an emotional heft behind his descriptions, yeah. both yeah. of his father's work as a toolmaker, but also of his father's sense of status and yeah. feeling uncomfortable or feeling that certain prizes were not for the likes of him. And yeah. I find that very yeah. powerful. Yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I've got a daughter who works in a care home and I, and I, you know, seeing the way she works, she's had several weekends without a weekend, without any time off because yes. of people being understaffed and so on. And, you know, and we saw it in the pandemic. We called them heroes, but we don't value them as heroes. And mm. I think paying, paying working class those jobs that are heroic. Um, does that make, some, you know, does it make somebody a hero just mm. doing their actual day to day hard graft job? You have to be, you know, you, you slightly conflated um, being a hero with being successful in wealthy terms and earning more money and going up the social 
classes, and I don't think you necessarily have to do that to be a hero. No, so well, another, quite, quite the opposite. That's what, that's what we're yeah. trying to pin down, is how you get yeah. away from the idea that you've, yeah. Only, yeah. you've only succeeded by moving upwards and away. I think you have to reward people with, and she doesn't get any, you know, they, they care workers don't get sick pay, so they can't afford to be off sick poorly. Um, so they go into work anyway, or they can't pay their mortgages. So that can't be right. And then I, and my only final um, mm. discon- un- un- unconnected thought was uh, on the topic of private education. Um, when people are do um, succeed, uh, they then want to give their children a, a priv- and I think, from my point of view, we have a caste system that is yes. um, that is that is perpetuated by having um, one, you know, one one uh, an no, education system that that su- suggests it's better than an education system where everybody learns from each other. And I think that's one of the sad things about our country. Well, it's one of the handcuffs. Value state education. It, it, I mean... It's, it's, the perpe- it's, it's one of the things that most perpetuates the, the inequality. But, I, you know, I, I, it, it makes hypocrites of all of us. Not you. It makes hypocrites of me. I can see the absolute unfairness in it. But my late father passed on to me the, the deep belief that if you can afford it for your children you jolly well buy it for them because otherwise you leave the pitch clear for the Reese Moggs and Camerons of this world and they've got quite enough privilege and advantage already thank you very much but that's why you can be um, a beneficiary of private education and a, a supporter of its abolition Tony is in Chingford Tony what would you like to say morning uh, hello I, I don't actually think that those two writers were talking about putting an individual or individuals on a pedestal, pedestal and shine a light on them. I think they were talking about the quiet people who just get up and get on with their life and get on with their job. I mean, uh, there was a movie, I'm oh, racking my brains trying to remember this, about this kid who wanted to join a gang and he thought it was the only way out and, you know, the only way to get money or to get recognition or to get some sort of status. Yes, and the gang gang leader turned around and says, "Well, your your dad is the hero. Your dad is the guy who gets up at six in the morning and goes and does this and does that. And you, you should stop looking at us for yeah. for, for your way out and, and look at uh, look at your own father because he's the one who's brave. He's the one who's, who's regardless of what he's got, he's he's making the most of it and getting on. You know, he's, he's doing they're his not, best. They're not mutually exclusive. Eh? They're, they're, I mean, the paper that oh, I'm no, ref- no, no, the no. paper I'm referring to specifically talks about working class cultural heroes. So they would that that would involve people who are creating art. Um, that, 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 oh, yeah, that, that's yeah, a yeah. cultural yeah. hero. But you're quite right. If we're talking in broader terms about what a working class hero is, then it is. It's people that, that hold it all together in circumstances that are less salubrious than the ones enjoyed by middle class and upper class people. Yeah, the real backbone of the country, those people. As, as a friend of mine once remarked to me when I said I didn't want to go work in a chicken factory, <laughs> yeah. he, said, uh, he said, you can't say that about people who do that sort of work because without them, there isn't anything else to build upon. Uh, yeah, except, I mean, that again, this is why I mentioned at the outset Tony, that as a middle class bloke, I do feel slightly conscious of, of, of being careful because most people, I mean, if you've got a real grind of a job, most people doing it would probably rather be doing something else. So it's not that insulting to say, oh, I didn't, I wouldn't fancy that myself. You, you can talk about yeah, a tick, yeah. in fact. Do you, do, do you see what I mean? In fact, aspiration is, is I mean, I always, I, my first home was in, in, in South Yorkshire and a lot of my parents' friends were, um, uh, well, there was a lot of coal miners around. They weren't, my parents' exclusive friendship group weren't coal miners, but very rarely did, did, did a dad want their son to go down the pit and very rarely did they actually actually break the chain it was that that's the relationship between opportunity and aspiration the dad doesn't want that for the son but the opportunities to do something else just just weren't there which speaks of a weird dichotomy doesn't it a weird contradiction yeah that gives me something more to think about actually well, you've said that yeah, you've given me yeah. given me plenty to think about as well thank you tony you are listening to james o'brien on lbc where this conversation doesn't have a definitive answer it's not mystery hour but but it does speak once again to this curious english condition of of thinking that some people are to the manner born and others should just know their place and that some prizes are not for the likes of us or of you or of him or of her and yet david cameron a man of no discernible ability whatsoever except a, a sort of clubbable demeanour and an alleged charm, uh, an ability to 
glide effortlessly through life without impediment or obstacle hindering him unduly, he can rise to the highest office in the land. So I, I, I sort of almost conclude that conversation where it began. Imagine he was born to a teenage single mother on a council estate. Where do you think he would be today? And, and, and then also remember that Angela Rayner was. <laughs> Whose journey do you think has been hardest? Whose climb has been steepest? Whose achievement is greatest? It's 12.46. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It is 12.49 and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. The uh, Sarah de Braverman may have been thrown out of the cabinet, but her legacy will be in some ways determined later this week when the ruling on the Rwandan deportation policy is finalised. Um, nobody knows which way it is going to go. But it occurred to me some time ago uh, that we have sort of glossed over, apart from the reports that I've shared with you about uh, refugees in Rwanda protesting against their food rations just a few short years ago and being shot dead for their troubles. The question of how suitable a destination for these uh, people uh, Rwanda might be hasn't really been asked enough it's it's the notion of deep we've talked a lot about deportation and not that much about Rwanda which is odd really when you think about it because the, the history of genocide in Rwanda was quite well documented in the west and for people who hadn't been fully aware of it the Hollywood film Hotel Rwanda was an astonishing introduction to some of the horrors that were visited upon that country during during that period. And it features, of course, the story of Paul Rusasa Begina, um, who was the, the character played by Don Cheadle in the movie. Now, I met Paul's daughter last year at the Magnitsky Awards, which are uh, un unfolding on Thursday night this year as well. And I'm delighted to say that not only is she with me now, but she's also going to pick up an award on Thursday, along with her sister Anais, for young human rights activist. And, and Corinne, I want to know a little bit about Rwanda, really, and I'm very grateful to you for being here today. Your, your dad, I mean, this isn't ancient history, is it? Because he was most recently arrested in 2020, essentially kidnapped. And last time we met, this time last year, you were still advocating for his release. He, he, ha he is now free. He's, he's back in Texas, I think. Yes, thank you for having me, James. Um, yes, my father has now been freed, but he spent uh, two and a half years wrongfully detained in prison uh, in Rwanda, where he was being tortured, um, was, was subjected to a sham trial and deprived of all his human rights. Uh, thankfully, after international pressure and the support of many human rights organizations and governments around the world, uh, the dictator of Rwanda was forced to let him go. We speak of Paul Kagame, who, who who remains in post. So, I, 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 what was your sort of initial reaction when you heard that a government such as the UK's government was doing business with Kagame's regime in in this way? I was absolutely shocked. Um, Rwanda is a dictatorship. There is one man in power who has been in power for almost thirty years and plans to be in power for another 10 years. He rules with an iron fist. There are no freedoms in Rwanda. And what happened to my father, his kidnapping across international border and sham trial and torture uh, is an example of the type of country that is ruled by this government, by the government of Rwanda. T tell us a little bit more uh, about what, what your dad did when, um, uh, well, he, he risked his own life to save more than 1,000 refugees. Tell us how he did that and what he was rescuing them from. Yes, yeah, so in 1994, there was a genocide in Rwanda. There was the, we have two major ethnic groups in Rwanda, the Hutus and the Tutsis. And during the genocide, um, the, there was an attempt at extermination of the Tutsi ethnicity. My father at the time was a hotel manager in the center of Kigali. And he opened the doors for everyone uh, who could make it to the front door of the hotel and gave them shelter. He protected them from the killers who were waiting outside. He risked his own life to protect these individuals. And after 76 days, everyone was safely evacuated to refugee camps outside of Kigali. And not a single person under his protection was killed. An extraordinary achievement. And had he not done it, they would not be here today. 
Yes, exactly. And in, in addition to that, um, both my biological parents in the genocide were killed, and uh, my sister and I's biological parents. And in addition to saving over 1,200 lives, he adopt, he saved my sister and I and adopted us and raised us as his own daughters. So he truly is a remarkable man and um, a courageous man. It, it, you, it, I mean, and yet it is an extraordinary sort of step up, isn't it? The, 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 do, have you spoken to him about what prompted him to do this, to risk his own life, most obviously? Mm -hmm. He to understood that um, it was important to take a stand, that we were ordinary people, and as ordinary people, we must make it uh, stand up to make a difference. We must stand up for humanity, for human dignity. And at the time, people were being killed for their ethnicity, and he refused to um, allow this to happen under his watch and decided to risk his own lives to protect others. And, and what was Paul Kagami doing during this period? At the time, Kagame was um, part of the army that came into Kigali with the attempt of um, taking power. And actually, after the genocide, um, when Paul Kagame heard of my father's role in the genocide, he did not like it that people were talking about this other man who had saved lives in the hotel. And so he sought to kill him. And that's what prompted our family to leave Rwanda and um, as refugees to seek asylum outside of the country. Successfully. Yes. Al albeit that in 2020, um, uh, w w when he was traveling internationally, the Rwandan authorities tracked him down or got hold of him. Yes, um, in 2020. Um, so after the, the movie uh, Hotel Rwanda came out, my father gained an international platform. And he used that platform, the platform he acquired through the movie, to call attention um, from the world to the abuses of human rights being perpetrated by the government of Rwanda. And he spoke loudly on every platform he could, which is why the government of Rwanda kidnapped him um, in order to silence him, to stop him from talking about the abuses being perpetrated by the regime. And all of which leads us back to the British government's current plans to deport asylum seekers and refugees back to the country from which your father helped over a thousand refugees escape. Just stringing those words together in the same sentence speaks of a, a madness almost. Yes, I mean, even last year, the UNHCR reported that over 8,000 people, um, Rwandans, fled uh, Rwanda to seek asylum in other countries because of the dictatorship, because of the abuses being perpetrated by the regime. And the, de the decision to send vulnerable people, refugees here in the United Kingdom, to a country that the United Kingdom knows very well is a dictatorship abusing the rights of its own people is absolutely unconscionable. Um, well, we will find out later this week what the latest chapter in that in that very sad story is. What 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 do you do these days, Corinne? Because I, I know you worked in investment at one point, but you you gave that up to pressure the Rwandan government into releasing him. Do you, you, you now dedicate yourself to, to this sort of work, I think. Yes. Um, what happened to my father, you know, the torture he was inflicted with and the suffering um, that he was inflicted with was... Um, opened my eyes to the suffering of many other Rwandans in the country and ar across the world, as well as the people in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, who are currently victim of a war that is being financed by the government of Rwanda. And we all have a voice. We all, as a vo uh, With my voice, we all have a responsibility to speak out on behalf of the people who are being silenced, who are being oppressed. Mm -hmm. And um, with everything I've learned and all the people I've met throughout the past two and a half years advocating for my father, um, I've taken on the responsibility of along with the rest of my family, to continue to, put, to shed a light on these abuses. I, well, thank you for that. And I, and I look forward to, to being part of the audience that will honour you and, and your sister Anais at the Magnitsky Awards on, on Thursday night. How, how, how fearful are you and your sister and your dad still? Because the circumstances in which your dad was captured, is, is the word I would use, or, or kidnapped, were remarkable. The plane he was on, he thought, was heading to Burundi. But obviously deals had been done and, uh, you know, money perhaps had changed hands. And instead he was taken back to Rwanda where he was arrested. So do, is there a threat? And I know you feel or you know that you've been illegally surveilled at times in, in your life as well. Do, do you, do, does the family still represent are you? Are you still a thorn in the side of Kagame? 
Yes, because um, Kagame and the government of Rwanda goes after anybody who dares to speak out against the regime, anybody who calls, who brings attention to the abuses of this government. And um, while I was advocating for my father, I was physically followed by agents of the government of Rwanda and um, harassed, whether on social media or through um, illegal surveillance of a spyware in my phone. I don't feel safe, but I also know that when we stop speaking, this is when they take the opportunity to, to hurt us. And so it's important to continue to speak out, to be loud and call, and call for accountability, call for the world to put uh, sanctions like the Magnitsky sanctions, targeted sanctions, which um, can be placed on individuals who are responsible for abuse of human rights. Um, I don't feel safe, but I think it's important to continue to speak. And finally, what would you say to British politicians who are... Um, well, I, I use the language that one of our politicians used herself. They are dreaming of the day that they see planes, a plane full of refugees flying to Rwanda, flying to Kigali. I would ask them to have some humanity and to not send vulnerable people and vulnerable refugees to a dictatorship. Karine Kanimba, thank you so much for your time today. And, uh, and as I say, I'll see you on Thursday. Thank you very much, James. Um, that's it from me for today. Uh, as, as I mentioned, Corinne and her sister Anais will be picking up their Magnitsky Award for Outstanding Young Human Rights Activist on, on Thursday night, and I'll tell you more about that ceremony on Friday. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back to the whole show podcast on Global Player, where you can also pause and even rewind live radio. You'll also find all of LBC's shows to catch up on, as well as the world's biggest podcasts. Pause and rewind live radio on Global Player, where you're always in control. Download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Tom Swarbrick will be with you at four on LBC, but now it's time for Sheila Fogarty. And that was very milk tray, man, that look you gave me when you said always in control, <laughs> <laughs> James. James O'Brien on LBC.